The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1 by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford. Section 24. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1 by Johann von Goethe. Translated by John Oxenford. Section 24. On this occasion, I cannot forbear recalling somewhat of my earlier youth, in order to make it obvious that the great affairs of the ecclesiastical religion must be carried on with order and coherence, if they are to prove as fruitful as is expected. The Protestant service has too little fullness and consistency to be able to hold the congregation together. Hence it easily happens that members secede from it and either form little congregations of their own or without ecclesiastical connection quietly carry on their citizen life side by side. Thus for a considerable time complaints were made that churchgoers were diminishing from year to year and just in the same ratio the persons who partook of the Lord's Supper. With respect to both, but especially the latter, the cause lies close at hand, but who dares to speak it out? We will make the attempt. In moral and religious, as well as in physical and civil matters, man does not like to do anything on the spur of the moment. He needs a sequence from which results habit, but he is to love and to perform. What he is to love and to perform, he cannot represent to himself as single or isolated. And if he is to repeat anything willingly, it must not have become strange to him. If the Protestant worship lacks fullness in general, so let it be investigated in detail, and it will be found that the Protestant has too few sacraments. Nay, indeed, he has only one in which he is himself an actor, the Lord's Supper. For baptism he sees only when it is performed on others, and is not greatly edified by it. The sacraments are the higher part of religion, the symbols to our senses of the extraordinary divine favor and grace. In the Lord's Supper, earthly lips are to receive a divine being, embodied, and partake of a heavenly under the form of an earthly nourishment. This import is the same in all kinds of Christian churches, whether the sacrament is taken with more or less submission to the mystery, with more or less accommodation as to that which is intelligible, it always remains a great holy thing, which in reality takes the place of the possible or the impossible the place of that which man can neither attain nor do without. But such a sacrament should not stand alone. No Christian can partake of it with the true joy for which it is given, if the symbolical or sacramental sense is not fostered within him. He must be accustomed to regard the inner religion of the heart and that of the external churches as perfectly one as the great universal sacrament, which again divides itself into so many others, and communicates to these parts its holiness, indestructibleness, and eternity. Here a youthful pair join hands, not for a passing salutation or for the dance, the priest pronounces his blessing upon them, and the bond is indissoluble. It is not long before this wedding pair bring a likeness to the threshold of the altar, it is purified with holy water, and so incorporated into the church that it cannot forfeit this benefit, but through the most monstrous apostasy. The child in the course of life goes on progressing in earthly things of its own accord. In heavenly things he must be instructed. Does it prove on examination that this has been fully done? He is now received into the bosom of the church as an actual citizen as a true and voluntary professor, not without outward tokens of the weightiness of his act. Now only he is decidedly a Christian. Now for the first time he knows his advantages and also his duties. But in the meantime, a great deal that is strange has happened to him as a man. 
through instruction and affliction he has come to know how critical appears the state of his inner self and there will constantly be a question of doctrines and of transgressions but punishment shall no longer take place for here in the infinite confusion in which he must entangle himself amid the conflict of natural and religious claims an admirable expedient is given him in confiding his deeds and misdeeds his infirmities and doubts to a worthy man appointed expressly for that purpose who knows how to calm to warn to strengthen him to chasten him likewise by symbolical punishment and at last by a complete washing away of his guilt to render him happy and to give him back pure and cleansed the tablet of his manhood thus prepared and purely set at rest by several sacramental acts which on closer examination branch forth again into minuter sacramental traits he kneels down to receive the host and that the mystery of this high act may be still enhanced he sees the chalice only in the distance it is no common eating and drinking that satisfies it is a heavenly feast which makes him thirst after heavenly drink let not the youth believe that this is all he has to do let not even the man believe it in earthly relations we are at last accustomed to depend on ourselves and even there knowledge understanding and character will not always suffice in heavenly things on the contrary we will never finish learning the higher feeling within us which often finds itself not even truly at home is besides oppressed by so much from without that our own power hardly administers all that is necessary for counsel consolation and help but to this end that remedy is instituted for our whole life and an intelligent pious man is continually waiting to show the right way to the wanderers and to relieve the distressed and what has been so well tried through the whole life is now to show forth all its healing power with tenfold activity at the gate of death with a capital d according to a trustful custom inculcated from youth upwards the dying man receives with fervor those symbolical significant assurances and there where every earthly warranty fails he is assured by a heavenly one of a blessed existence for all eternity he feels perfectly convinced that neither a hostile element nor a malignant spirit can hinder him from clothing himself with a glorified body so that in immediate relations with the godhead with a capital g he may partake of the boundless happiness which flows forth from him then in conclusion that the whole may be made holy the feet also are anointed and blessed they are to feel even in the event of possible recovery a repugnance to touching this earthly hard impenetrable soil a wonderful elasticity is to be imparted to them by which they spurn from under them the clod of earth which hitherto attracted them and so through a brilliant cycle of equally holy acts the beauty of which we have only briefly hinted at the cradle and the grave however far asunder they may chance to be are joined in one continuous circle but all these spiritual wonders spring not like other fruits from the natural soil where they can neither be sown nor planted nor cherished we must supplicate for them from another region a thing which cannot be done by all persons nor at all times here we meet the highest of these symbols derived from pious tradition we are told that one man may be more favored blessed and sanctified from above than another but that this may not appear as a natural gift this great boon bounded up with a heavy duty must be communicated to others by one authorized person to another and the greatest good that a man can attain without his having to obtain it by his own wrestling or grasping must be preserved and perpetuated on earth by spiritual inheritance in the very ordination of the priest is comprehended all that is necessary for the effectual solemnizing of those holy acts by which the multitude receive grace without any other activity being needful on their part than that of faith and implicit confidence 
and thus the priest joins the line of his predecessors and successors in the circle of those anointed with him representing the highest source of blessings so much the more gloriously as it is not he the priest whom we reverence but his office it is not his nod to which we bow the knee but the blessing which he imparts and which seems the more holy and to come the more immediately from heaven because earthly instrument cannot at all weaken or invalidate it by its own sinful nay wicked nature how is this truly spiritual connection shattered to pieces in protestantism by part of the above-mentioned symbols being declared apophrical and only a few canonical and how by their indifference to one of these will they prepare us for the high dignity of the others in my time i had been confided to the religious instruction of a good old infirm clergyman who had been confessor of the family for many years the catechism a paraphrase of it and the scheme of salvation i had at my fingers ends i lacked not one of the strongly proving biblical texts but from all this i reaped no fruit for as they assured me that the honest old man arranged his chief examination according to an old set form i lost all pleasure and inclination for the business spent the last week in all sorts of diversions laid in my hat the loose leaves borrowed from an older friend who had gotten them from the clergyman and unfeelingly and senselessly read aloud all that i should have known how to utter with feeling and conviction but i found my good intention and my aspirations in this important matter still more paralyzed by a dry spiritless routine when i was now to approach the confessional i was indeed conscious of having many failings but no great faults and that very consciousness diminished them since it directed me to the moral strength which lay within me and which with resolution and perseverance was at last to become master over the old adam we were taught that we were much better than the catholics for the very reason that we were not obliged to confess anything in particular in the confessional nay that this would not be at all proper even if we wished to do it i did not like this at all for i had the strangest religious doubts which i would readily have had cleared up on such an occasion now as this was not to be done i composed a confession for myself which while it well expressed my state of mind was to confess to an intelligent man in general terms that which i was forbidden to tell him in detail but when i entered the old choir of the barefoot friars when i approached the strange latticed closets in which the revered gentlemen used to be found for that purpose when the sexton opened the door for me when i now saw myself shut up in the narrow place face to face with my spiritual grandsire and he bade me welcome with his weak nasal voice all the light of my mind and heart was extinguished at once the well-conned confessional speech would not cross my lips in my embarrassment i opened the book i had in my hand and read from it the first short form i saw which was so general that anybody might have spoken it with quite a safe conscience i received absolution and withdrew neither warm nor cold went the next day with my parents to the table of the lord and for a few days behaved myself as was becoming after so holy an act in the sequel however there came over me that evil which from the fact of our religion being complicated by various dogmas and founded on texts of scripture which admit of several interpretations attacks scrupulous men in such a manner that it brings on a hypochondriacal condition and raises this to its highest point to fixed ideas i have known several men who though their manner of thinking and living was perfectly rational could not free themselves from thinking about the sin against the holy spirit and from the fear that they had committed it a similar trouble threatened me on the subject of the communion for the text that one who unworthily partakes of the sacrament eateth and drinketh damnation to himself had very early already made a monstrous impression upon me
every fearful thing that i had read in the histories of the middle ages of the judgments of god of those most strange ordeals by red-hot iron flaming fire swelling water and even what the bible tells us of the drought which agrees well with the innocent but puffs up and bursts the guilty all this pictured itself to my imagination and formed itself into the most frightful combinations since false vows hypocrisy perjury blasphemy all seemed to weigh down the unworthy person at this most holy act which was so much the more horrible as no one could dare to pronounce himself worthy in the forgiveness of sins by which everything was to be at last done away was found limited by so many conditions that one could not with certainty dare appropriate it to one's self this gloomy scruple troubled me to such a degree and the expedient which they would represent to me as sufficient seemed so bald and feeble that it gave the bugbear only a more fearful aspect and as soon as i had reached leipzig i tried to free myself altogether from my connection with the church how oppressive then must have been to me the exhortations of Galen, whom considering the generally laconic style with which he was obliged to repel our obtrusiveness i was unwilling to trouble with such singular questions and the less so as in my more cheerful hours i weigh myself ashamed of them and at last left completely behind me this strange anguish of conscience, together with church and altar. Galert, in accordance with his pious feelings, had composed for himself a course of ethics, which from time to time he publicly read, and thus in an honorable manner acquitted himself of his duty to the public. Galert's writings had already, for a long time, been the foundation of German moral culture, and everyone anxiously wished to see that work printed but as this was not to be done until after the good man's death people thought themselves very fortunate to hear him deliver it himself in his lifetime the philosophical auditorium footnote the lecture room the word is also used in university language to denote a professor's audience and footnote was at such times crowded and the beautiful soul the pure will and the interest of the noble man in our welfare his exhortations warnings and entreaties uttered in a somewhat hollow and sorrowful tone made indeed an impression for the moment but this did not last long the less so as there were many scoffers who contrived to make us suspicious of his tender and as they thought enervating manner i remember a frenchman travelling through the town who asked what were the maxims and opinions of the man who attracted such an immense concourse when we had given him the necessary information he shook his head and said smiling laissez le faire il nous forme des dupes End quote. and thus also did good society which cannot easily endure anything worthy near it know how to spoil on occasion the moral influence which gallert might have had upon us now it was taken ill of him that he instructed the deans of distinction and wealth who were particularly recommended to him better than the other students and had a marked solicitude for them now he was charged with selfishness and nepotism for causing a table de hote to be established for these young men at his brother's house his brother a tall good-looking blunt unceremonious and somewhat coarse man had it was said been a fencing master and notwithstanding the too great lenity of his brother the noble boarders were often treated harshly and roughly hence the people thought they must again take the part of these young folks and pulled about the good reputation of the excellent gallert to such a degree that in order not to be mistaken about him we became indifferent towards him and visited him no more yet we always saluted him in our best manner when he came riding along on his tame gray horse this horse the elector had sent him to oblige him to take an exercise so necessary for his health a distinction for which he was not easily to be forgiven and thus by degrees the epoch approached when all authority was to vanish from before me and i was to become suspicious nay to despair even of the greatest and best individuals whom i had known or imagined 
Frederick the Second still stood at the head of all the distinguished men of the century in my thoughts, and it must therefore have appeared very surprising to me that I could praise him as little before the inhabitants of Leipzig as formerly in my grandfather's house. They had felt the hand of war heavily, it is true, and therefore they were not to blame for not thinking the best of him who had begun and continued it. They, therefore, were willing to let him pass as a distinguished, but by no means as a great man. There was no art, they said, in performing something with great means, and if one spares neither lands, nor money, nor blood, one may well accomplish one's purpose at last. Frederick had shown himself great in none of his plans, and in nothing that he had, properly speaking, undertaken. So long as it depended on him, he had only gone on making blunders, and what was extraordinary in him had only come to light when he was compelled to make these blunders good again. It was purely from this that he had obtained his great reputation, since every man wishes for himself the same talent for making good, in a clever way, the blunders which he frequently commits. If one goes through the Seven Years' War step by step, it will be found that the king quite uselessly sacrificed his fine army, and that it was his own fault that this ruinous feud had been protracted to so great a length. A truly great man in general would have got the better of his enemies much sooner. That was the end of a quotation. In support of these opinions, they could cite infinite details, which I did not know how to deny and I felt the unbounded reverence which I had devoted to this remarkable prince from my youth upwards, gradually cooling away. As the inhabitants of Leipzig had now destroyed for me the pleasant feeling of revering a great man, so did a new friend, whom I gained at the time, very much diminish the respect which I entertained for my present fellow-citizens. This friend was one of the strangest fellows in the world. He was named Berish, and was tutor to the young Count Lindenau. Even his exterior was singular enough. Lean and well-built, far advanced in his thirties, a very large nose, and altogether marked features. He wore from morning till night a scratch, which might well have been called a peruke. He dressed himself very neatly, and never went out but with his sword by his side, and his hat under his arm. He was one of those men who have quite a peculiar gift of killing time, or, rather, who know how to make something out of nothing in order to pass time away. Everything he did had to be done with slowness, and with a certain deportment which might have been called affected if Berish had not even by nature had something affected in his manner. He resembled an old Frenchman, and also spoke and wrote French very well and easily. His greatest delight was to busy himself seriously about drolleries, and to follow up without end any silly notion. Thus he was constantly dressed in grey, and as the different parts of his attire were of different material, and also of different shades, he could reflect for whole days as to how he could procure one gray more for his body, and was happy when he had succeeded in this, and could put to shame us who had doubted it, or had pronounced it impossible. He then gave us long, severe lectures about our lack of inventive power, and our want of faith in his talents. For the rest, he had studied well, was particularly versed in the modern languages and their literature, and wrote an excellent hand. He was very well disposed towards me, and I, having been always accustomed and inclined to the society of older persons, soon attached myself to him. My intercourse served him, too, for a special amusement, since he took pleasure in taming my restlessness and impatience, with which, on the other hand, I gave him enough to do. In the art of poetry he had what is called taste, a certain general opinion about the good and the bad, the mediocre and tolerable. But his judgment was rather censorious, and he destroyed even the little faith in contemporary writers which I cherished within me, by unfeeling remarks, which he knew how to advance with wit and humor, 
about the writings and poems of this man and that he received my productions with indulgence and let me have my own way but only on the condition that i should have nothing printed he promised me on the other hand that he himself would copy those pieces which he thought good and would present me with them in a handsome volume this undertaking now afforded an opportunity for the greatest possible waste of time for before he could find the right paper before he could make up his mind as to the size before he had settled the breadth of the margin and the form of handwriting, before the crow quills were provided and cut into pens, and Indian ink was rubbed, whole weeks passed without the least bit having been done. With just as much ado, he always set about his writing, and really, by degrees, put together a most charming manuscript. The title of the poems was in German text, the verses themselves in a perpendicular Saxon hand, and at the end of every poem was an analogous vignette, which he had either selected somewhat or other, or had invented himself, and in which he contrived to imitate very neatly the hatching of the woodcuts and tailpieces which are used for such purposes. To show me these things as he went on, to celebrate beforehand in a comical pathetical manner my good fortune in seeing myself immortalized in such exquisite handwriting and that in a style which no printing press could attain gave another occasion for passing the most agreeable hours in the meantime his intercourse was always secretly instructive by reason of his liberal acquirements and as he knew how to subdue my restless impetuous disposition was also quite wholesome for me in a moral sense he had too quite a peculiar abhorrence of roughness and his jests were always quaint without ever falling into the coarse or the trivial he indulged himself in a distorted aversion from his countrymen and described with ludicrous touches even what they were able to undertake he was particularly inexhaustible in a comical representation of individual persons as he found something to find fault with in the exterior of every one thus when we lay together at the window he could occupy himself for hours criticizing the passers-by and when he had censured them long enough in showing exactly and circumstantially how they ought to have dressed themselves ought to have walked and ought to have behaved to look like ordinary people such attempts for the most part ended in something improper and absurd so that we might not so much laugh at how the man looked but at how perchance he might have looked had he been mad enough to caricature himself in all such matters Mariche went quite unmercifully to work without being in the slightest degree malicious on the other hand we knew how to tease him on our side by assuring him that to judge from his exterior he must be taken if not for a french dancing master at least for the academical teacher of the language this reproval was usually the signal for dissertations an hour long in which he used to set forth the difference wide as the heavens which there was between him and an old frenchman at the same time he commonly imputed to us all sorts of awkward attempts that we might possibly have made for the alteration and modification of his wardrobe my poetical compositions which i only carried on the more zealously as the transcript went on becoming more beautiful and more careful now inclined altogether to the natural and the true and if the subjects could not always be important i nevertheless always endeavored to express them clearly and pointedly the more so as my friend often gave me to understand what a great thing it was to write down a verse on dutch paper with the crow quill and the indian ink what time talent and exertion it required which ought not to be squandered on anything empty and superfluous he would at the same time open a finished parcel and circumstantially to explain what ought not to stand in this or that place or congratulate us that it actually did not stand there he then spoke with great contempt of the art of printing mimicked the compositor ridiculed his gestures 
and his hurried picking out of letters here and there, and derived from this manoeuvre all the calamities of literature. On the other hand, he extolled the grace and noble posture of a writer, and immediately sat down himself to exhibit it to us, while he rated us at the same time for not demeaning ourselves at the writing-table precisely after his example and motto. He now reverted to the contrast with the compositor, turned the begun letter upside down, and showed how unseemly it would be to write anything from the bottom to the top, or from the right to the left, with other things of like kind with which whole volumes might have been filled. With such harmless fooleries we squandered our precious time, while it could have occurred to none of us that anything would chance to proceed out of our circle which would awaken a general sensation and bring us into not the best repute. Gellert may have taken little pleasure in his practicum, and if perhaps he took pleasure in giving some directions as to prose and poetical style, he did it most privately only to a few, among whom we could not number ourselves. Professor Clodius thought to fill the gap which thus arose in the public instruction. He had gained some renown in literature, criticism, and poetry, and as a young, lively, obliging man, found many friends, both in the university and in the city. Gellert himself referred us to the lectures now commenced by him, and as far as the practical manner was concerned, we remarked little difference. He, too, only criticized details, corrected likewise with red ink, and one found oneself in company with mere blunders, without a prospect as to where the right was to be sought. I had brought to him some of my little labors, which he did not treat harshly, but just at this time they wrote to me from home that I must, without fail, furnish a poem for my uncle's wedding. I felt far removed from that light and frivolous period in which a similar thing would have given me pleasure and since I could get nothing out of the actual circumstance itself, I determined to trick out my work in the best manner with extraneous ornament. I therefore convened all Olympus to consult about the marriage of a Frankfurt lawyer, and seriously enough to be sure, as well became the festival of such an honorable man. Venus and Themis had quarreled for his sake, but a roguish prank, which Amor played the latter, gained the suit for the former, and the gods decided in favor of the marriage. My work by no means displeased me. I received from home a handsome letter in its praise, took the trouble to have another fair copy, and hoped to exhort some applause from my professor also. But here I missed my aim. He took the matter severely, and as he did not notice the tone of parody which nevertheless lay in the notion, he declared the great expenditure of divine means for such an insignificant human end in the highest degree reprehensible. Invade against the use and abuse of such mythological figures as a false habit originating in pedantic times, found the expression now too high, now too low, and in diverse particulars had indeed not spared the red ink, though he asserted that he had yet done too little. Such pieces were read aloud and criticized anonymously, it is true, but we used to watch each other, and it remained no secret that this unfortunate assembly of the gods was my work, yet since his critique, when I took his point of view, seemed to be perfectly just, and those divinities more nearly inspected were in fact only hollow shadow forms. I cursed all Olympus, flung the whole mythic pantheon away, and from that time Amor and Luna have been the only divinities which at all appear in my little poems. Among the persons whom Berish had chosen as the butt of his wit, Clodius stood just at the head, nor was it hard to find a comical side in him. Being of small stature, rather stout and thick-set, he was violent in his motions, somewhat impetuous in his utterances, and restless in his demeanor. In all this, he differed from his fellow citizens, who nevertheless willingly put up with him on account of his good qualities and the fine promise which he gave. 
he was usually commissioned with the poems which had become necessary on festive occasions in the so-called ode he followed the manner employed by ramler whom however it alone suited but clodius as an imitator had especially marked the foreign words by means of which the poems of ramler come forth with a majestic pomp which because it is conformable to the greatness of his subject and the rest of his poetic treatment produces a very good effect on the ear feelings and imagination in clodius on the contrary these expressions had a heterogeneous air since his poetry was in other respects not calculated to elevate the mind in any manner now we had often been obliged to see such poems printed and highly lauded in our presence and we found it highly offensive that he who had sequestered the heathen gods from us now wished to hammer together another ladder to parnassus out of greek and roman word brunks these oft-recurring expressions stamped themselves firmly on our memory and in a merry hour when we were eating some most excellent cakes in the kitchen gardens parenthesis kolgarten and parenthesis it all at once struck me to put together these words of might and power in a poem on the cake baker Handel. No sooner thought than done, and let it stand here too, as it was written on the wall of the house with a lead pencil. A uh, Handel, dessen rum vom zut zum Norden reich virinim den pon der zu deinem Ohren stadt. Du bakst was Gorlin und Britten im Sieg suchen mit Schopfischen Genie originale Kuchen. Das Kaffee's Ocean der Sieg vor der Ergist ist Susef aus der Saft der Wohn Heimitus fließt. Dein Haus ein Monument wie wir denn konsten lohnen umhängen mit trophen er saut den nationen auch ohne diedem fand händel hier sein glück und rapte dem hothurn gar manch acht groschen stück glinst deine urn der einst in majestätischen pampe dann weint der Patriot an deinem Katakombe. Doch leb, dein Taurus, se von Idler brut ein Nest. Steh hoch wie der Olymp, wie der Parnassus fest. Kein Phalanx, Griechenland mit römischen Ballisten, Vermug, Germanien und Händel zu verwusten. Dein Wohl ist unser Stolz, dein Leiden unser Schmerz, und Handels Tempel ist der Musensohin Herz. Footnote. The humor of the above consists not in the thoughts, but in the particular words employed. These have no remarkable effect in English, as to us the words of Latin origin are often as familiar as those which have Teutonic roots and these form the chief peculiarity of the style we have therefore given the poem in the original language with the peculiar words as indicated by goethe in italics and subjoin a literal translation it will be observed that we have said that the peculiarity consists chiefly not solely in the use of the foreign words for there are two or three instances of unquestionably German words which are italicized on account of their high-sounding pomp. Quote, o Handel, whose fame extends from south to north, hear the pan which ascends to thine ears. Thou bakest that which Gauls and Britons industriously seek, thou bakest with creative genius original cakes the ocean of coffee which pours itself out before thee is sweeter than the juice which flows from hymetus thy house a monument how we reward the arts hung around with trophies tells the nations even without a diadem 
Handel formed his fortune here, and robbed the Quarthurnus of many an eight groschen piece. When thy urn shines hereafter in majestic pomp, then will the patriot weep at thy catacomb. But live, let thy bed, parenthesis, Taurus, end parenthesis, be the nest of a noble brood, stand high as Olympus, and firm as Parnassus. May no phalanx of Greek with Roman ballisto be able to destroy Germania and Handel. Thy wheel is our pride, thy woe our pain, and Handel's temple is the heart of the sons of the muses. End of translation. This poem had its place for a long time among many others which disfigured the walls of that room without being noticed, and we, who had sufficiently amused ourselves with it, forgot it altogether amongst other things. A long time afterwards, Clodius came out with his Maidon, whose wisdom, magnanimity, and virtue we found infinitely ridiculous, much as his first representation of the piece was applauded. That evening, when we met together in the wine-house, I made a prologue in doggerel verse, in which Harlequin steps out with two great sacks, places them on each side of the proscenium, and after various preliminary jokes, tells the spectators in confidence that in the two sacks moral ascetic dust is to be found, which the actors will very frequently throw into their eyes. One, to wit, was filled with good deeds that cost nothing, and the other with splendidly expressed opinions that had no meaning behind them. He reluctantly withdrew and sometimes came back, earnestly exhorted the spectators to attend to his warning and shut their eyes, reminded them that he had always been their friend and meant well with them, with many more things of the kind. This prologue was acted in the room on the spot by friend Horn, but the jest remained quite among ourselves. Not even a copy had been taken, and the paper was soon lost. However, Horn, who had performed the harlequin, very prettily took it into his head to enlarge my poem to Handel by several verses, and then to make it refer to Medan. He read it to us, but we could not take any pleasure in it, for we did not find the additions even ingenious, while the first poem, being written for quite a different purpose, seemed to us disfigured. Our friend, displeased with our indifference, or rather censure, may have shown it to others, who found it new and amusing. Copies were now made of it, to which the reputation of Clodius's Medan gave at once a rapid publicity. Universal disapproval was the consequence, and the originators, parenthesis, it was soon found out that the poem had proceeded from our clique, in parenthesis, were severely censured, for nothing of the sort had been seen since Chronic's and Roast's attacks upon Gutshed. We had besides already secluded ourselves and now found ourselves quite in the case of the owl with respect to the other birds. In Dresden, too, they did not like the affair, and it had for us serious, if not unpleasant, consequences. For some time already, Count Lindenau had not been quite satisfied with his son's tutor, for although the young man was by no means neglected, and Barish kept himself either in the chamber of the young court, or at least close to it, when the instructors gave their daily lessons, regularly frequented the lectures with him, never went out in the daytime without him, and accompanied him in all his walks yet the rest of us were always to be found in Apple's house, and joined them whenever they went on a pleasure ramble. This already excited some attention. Barish, too, accustomed himself to our society, and at last, towards nine o'clock in the evenings, generally transferred his pupil into the hands of the valet de chambre, and went in quest of us to the wine-house whither, however, he never used to come but in shoes and stockings, with his sword by his side, and commonly his hat under his arm. The jokes and fooleries which he generally started went on ad infinitum. Thus, for instance, one of our friends had a habit of going away precisely at ten, 
because he had a connection with a pretty girl with whom he could converse only at that hour we did not like to lose him and one evening when we sat very happily together very secretly determined that he would not let him off this time at the stroke of ten the other arose and took leave Berish called after him and begged him to wait a moment as he was just going with him he now began in the most amusing manner first to look after his sword which stood just before his eyes and in buckling it on behaved awkwardly so that he could never accomplish it he did this too so naturally that no one took offence at it but when to vary the theme he at last went farther so that the sword came now on the right side now between his legs and universal laughter arose in which the man in a hurry who was likewise a merry fellow chimed in and let baruch have his own way till the happy hour was past when for the first time there followed general pleasure and agreeable conversation till deep into the night unfortunately Barish and we through him had a certain other propensity for some girls who were better than their reputation by which our own reputation could not be improved we had often been seen in their garden and we directed our walks thither even when the young count was with us all this may have been treasured up and at last communicated to his father enough he sought in a gentlemanly manner to get rid of the tutor to whom the event proved fortunate his good exterior his knowledge and talents his integrity which no one could call in question had won him the affection and esteem of distinguished persons on whose recommendation he was appointed tutor to the hereditary prince of dessa and at the court of a prince excellent in every respect found a solid happiness the loss of a friend like Barish was of the greatest consequence to me. He had spoiled while he cultivated me, and his presence was necessary, if the pains he had thought good to spend upon me were in any degree to bring forth fruit for society. He knew how to engage me in all kinds of pretty and agreeable things, in whatever was just appropriate, and to bring out my social talents but as i had gained no self-dependence in such things so when i was alone again i immediately relapsed into my confused and crabbed disposition which always increased the more discontented i was with those around me since i fancied that they were not contented with me with the most arbitrary caprice i took offence at what i might have considered an advantage thus alienated many with whom i had hitherto been on a tolerable footing and on account of the many disagreeable consequences which i had drawn on myself and others whether by doing or leaving undone by doing too much or too little was obliged to hear the remark from my well-wishers that i lacked experience the same thing was told me by every person of sound sense who saw my productions especially when these referred to the external world i observed this as well as i could but found in it little that was edifying and was still forced to add enough of my own to make it only tolerable i had often pressed my friend Barish too that he would make plain to me what was meant by experience but because he was full of nonsense he put me off with fair words from one day to another and at last after great preparations disclosed to me that true experience was properly when one experiences how an experienced man must experience in experiencing his experience now when we scolded him outrageously and called him to account for this he assured us that a great mystery lay hidden behind these words which we could not comprehend until we had experienced and so on without end for it cost him nothing to talk on in that way by the quarter of an hour since the experience would always become more experienced and at last come to true experience when we were about to despair at such fooleries he protested that he had learned this way of making himself intelligible and impressive from the latest and greatest authors who had made us observe how one can rest a restful rest and how silence 
in being silent can constantly become more silent by chance an officer who came among us on furlough was praised in good company as a remarkable sound-minded and experienced man who had fought through the seven years war and had gained universal confidence it was not difficult for me to approach him and we often went walking with each other the idea of experience had almost become fixed in my brain and the craving to make it clear to me passionate being of a frank disposition i disclosed to him the uneasiness in which i found myself he smiled and was kind enough to tell me as an answer to my question something of his own life and generally of the world immediately about us from which indeed little better was to be gathered than that experience convinces us that our best thoughts wishes and designs are unattainable and that he who fosters such vagaries and advances them with eagerness is especially held to be an inexperienced man yet as he was a gallant good fellow he assured me that he had himself not quite given up these vagaries and felt himself tolerably well off with the little faith love and hope which remained he then felt obliged to tell me a great deal about war about the sort of life in the field about skirmishes and battles especially so far as he had taken part in them when these vast events by being considered in relation to a single individual gained a very marvellous aspect i then led him on to an open narration of the state situation of the court which seemed to me quite like a tale i heard of the bodily strength of augustus the second of his many children and his vast expenses then of his successor's love of art and of making collections of count bruhl and his boundless love of magnificence which in detail appeared almost absurd of his numerous banquets and gorgeous amusements which were cut off by frederick's invasion of saxony the royal castles now lay in ruins bruhl's splendors were annihilated and of the whole a glorious land much injured alone remained when he saw me astonished at that mad enjoyment of fortune and then grieved by the calamity that followed and informed me that one expects from an experienced man exactly this that he shall be astonished at neither the one nor the other nor take too lively an interest in them i felt a great desire still to remain a while in the same experience as hitherto in which desire he strengthened me and very urgently entreated me for the present at least always to cling to agreeable experiences and to try to avoid those that were disagreeable as much as possible if they should intrude themselves upon me but once when the discussion was again about experience in general and i related to him those ludicrous phrases of my friend barish he shook his head smiling and said quote, there one sees how it is with words which are only once uttered these sound so comical nay so silly that it would seem almost impossible to put a rational meaning into them and yet perhaps the attempt might be made End quote. and when i pressed him he replied in his intelligent cheerful manner quote, if you will allow me while commenting on and completing your friend's observations to go on after his fashion i shall i think he meant to say that experience is nothing else than that one experiences what one does not wish to experience which is what it amounts to for the most part at least in this world End of section 24. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1, by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, Section 25. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1, by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, Section 25. Another man, although infinitely different from Berish in every respect, might yet be compared with him in a certain sense. I mean Oser, who was also one of those men who dream away their lives in a comfortable state of being busy. His friends themselves secretly acknowledged that with very fine natural powers he had not spent his younger years in sufficient activity for which reason he never went so far as to practice his art with perfect technicality. Yet a certain diligence appeared to be reserved for his old age, and during the many years which I knew him he never lacked invention or laboriousness. From the very first moment he had attracted me very much. Even his residence, strange and portentous, was highly charming to me. In the old castle, Pleissenburg, at the right-hand corner one ascended a repaired, cheerful, winding staircase. The saloons of the Academy of Design, of which he was director, were found to the left, and were light and roomy, but he himself could only be reached through a narrow, dark passage at the end of which one first sought the entrance into his apartments, having just passed between the whole suite of them and an extensive granary. The first apartment was adorned with pictures from the later Italian school, by masters whose grace he used highly to commend. As I, with some noblemen, had taken private lessons of him, we were permitted to draw here, and we often penetrated into his adjoining private cabinet, which contained at the same time his few books, collections of art and natural curiosities, and whatever else might have most interested him. Everything was arranged with taste, simply, and in such a manner that the little space held a great deal. The furniture, presses, and portfolios were elegant, without affection or superfluity. Thus also the first thing which he recommended to us, and to which he always recurred, was simplicity in everything that art and manual labor united are called upon to produce being a sworn foe to the scroll and shell style, and of the whole taste for quaintness, he showed us in copper plates and drawings old patterns of the sort contrasted with better decorations and simpler forms of furniture, as well as with other appurtenances of a room, and because everything about him corresponded with these maxims, his words and instructions made a good and lasting impression on us. Besides this, he had an opportunity to let us see his opinions in practice, since he stood in good consideration, both with private and with official persons, and was asked for advice when there were new buildings and alterations. He seemed in general to be more fond of preparing things on occasion for a certain end and use than of undertaking and completing such as exist for themselves and require a greater perfection. He was therefore always ready and at hand when the publishers needed larger and smaller copper plates for any work. Thus the vignettes to Winkelmann's first writings were etched by him, but he often made only sketchy drawings to which Geiser knew very well how to adapt himself. His figures had throughout something general, not to say ideal. His women were pleasing and agreeable. His children, naive enough, only he could not succeed with the men, who in his spirited but always cloudy, and at the same time foreshortening manner, had for the most part the look of Lazarani. Since he designed his composition less with regard to form than to light, shade, and masses, the general effect was good, as indeed the same that he did and produced was attended by a peculiar grace, as he at the same time neither could nor would control a deep-rooted propensity to the significant and the allegorical, to that which excites a secondary thought. So his works always furnished something to reflect upon, and were complete through a conception, 
even where they could not be so from art and execution thus bias which is always dangerous frequently led him to the very bounds of good taste if not beyond them he often sought to attain his views by the oddest notions and by whimsical jests nay his best works always have a touch of humour if the public were not always satisfied with such things he revenged himself by a new and even stranger drollery thus he afterwards exhibited in the ante-room of the great concert hall an ideal female figure in his own style who was raising a pair of snuffers to a taper and he was exceedingly delighted when he was able to cause a dispute on the question whether this singular muse meant to snuff the light or to extinguish it when he roguishly allowed all sorts of bantering by thoughts to peep forth but the building of the new theatre in time made the greatest noise in which his curtain when it was still quite new had certainly an uncommonly charming effect Oser had taken the muses out of the clouds upon which they usually hover on such occasions and set them upon the earth the statues of sophocles and aristophanes around whom all the modern dramatic writers were assembled adorned a vestibule to the temple of fame here too the goddesses of the arts were likewise present and all was dignified and beautiful but now comes the oddity through the open centre was seen the portal of the distant temple and a man in a light jerkin was passing between the two above-mentioned groups and without troubling himself about them directly up to the temple he was seen from behind and was not particularly distinguished now this man was to represent shakespeare who without predecessors or followers without concerning himself about models went to meet immortality in his own way this work was executed on the great floor over the new theatre quote we often assembled round him there and in that place i read aloud to him the proof sheets of mazarion end quote. as to myself i by no means advanced in the practice of the art his instructions worked upon our minds and our taste but his own drawings was too undefined to guide me who had only glimmered along by the objects of art and of nature to a severe and decided practice of the faces and bodies he gave us rather the aspect in the forms rather the postures than the proportions he gave us the conception of the figures and desired that we should impress them vividly upon our minds that might have been beautifully and properly done if he had not had mere beginners before him if on this account a preeminent talent for instruction may be well denied him it must on the other hand be acknowledged that he was very discreet and politic and that a happy adroitness of mind qualified him very peculiarly for a teacher in a higher sense the deficiencies under which each one labored he clearly saw but he disdained to reprove them directly and rather hinted his praise and censure indirectly and very laconically one was now compelled to think over the matter and soon came to a far deeper insight tim's for instance i had very carefully executed after a pattern a nosegay on blue paper with white and black crayon and partly with the stump partly by hatching it up had tried to give effect to the little picture after i had been long laboring in this way he once came behind me and said more paper upon which he immediately withdrew my neighbor and i puzzled our heads as to what this could mean for my bouquet on a large half sheet had plenty of space around it after we had reflected a long time we thought at last that we had hit his meaning when he remarked that by working together the black and the white i had quite covered up the blue background had destroyed the middle tint and in fact with great industry had produced a disagreeable drawing as to the rest he did not fail to instruct us in perspective and light and shade sufficiently indeed but always so that we had to exert and torment ourselves to find the applications of the principles communicated probably his view with regard to us who do not intend to become artists was only to form the judgment of taste and to make us acquainted with the requisites of a work of art without precisely requiring that we should produce one 
since moreover patient industry was not my talent for nothing gave me pleasure except what came to me at once so by degrees i was discouraged if not lazy and as knowledge is more comfortable than doing i was quite content to follow wherever he chose after his own fashion to lead us at this time the lives of the painters by de argenville was translated into german i obtained it quite fresh and studied it assiduously enough this seemed to please Ulcer, and he procured us an opportunity of seeing many a portfolio out of the great Leipzig collections, and thus introduced us to the history of the art. But even these exercises produced in me an effect different from that which he probably had in mind. The manifold subjects which I saw treated by artists awakened the poetic talent in me, and as one easily makes an engraving for a poem, so did i now make poems to the engravings and drawings by contriving to present to myself the personages introduced in them in their previous and subsequent condition and sometimes to compose a little song which might have suited them and thus accustomed myself to consider the arts in connection with each other even the mistakes which i made so that my poems were often descriptive were useful to me in the sequel when i came to more reflection by making me attentive to the differences between the arts. Of such little things, many were in the collection which Berish had arranged, and there is nothing left of them now. The atmosphere of art and taste in which Ulcer lived, and into which one was drawn, provided one visited him frequently, was the more and more worthy and delightful, because he was fond of remembering departed or absent persons with whom he had been or still continued to be on good terms for if he had once given any one his esteem he remained unalterable in his conduct towards him and always showed himself equally friendly after we had heard calus preeminently extolled among the french he made us also acquainted with germans of activity in this department thus we learn that professor christ as an amateur a collector a connoisseur a fellow laborer had done good service for art and had applied his learning to its true improvement heineken on the contrary could not be honorably mentioned because he devoted himself too assiduously to the ever childish beginnings of german art which also little valued partly because he had once treated winkelmann shabbily which could never be forgiven him our attention however was strongly drawn to the labors of liepert since our instructor knew how to set forth his merit sufficiently for he said although single statues and larger groups of sculpture remain the foundation and the summit of all knowledge of art yet either as originals or as casts they are seldom to be seen on the contrary by liepert a little world of gems is made known in which the more comprehensive merit of the ancients their happy invention judicious composition tasteful treatment are made more striking and intelligible while from the great number of them comparison is much more possible end of that quotation while now we were busying ourselves with these as much as was allowed winkelmann's lofty life of art in italy was pointed out and we took his writings in hand with devotion for Ulcer had a passionate reverence for him, which he was able easily to instill into us. The problematic part of these little treatises, which are, besides, confused even from their irony and from their referring to opinions and events altogether peculiar, we were indeed unable to decipher. But as Ulcer had great influence over us and incessantly gave them out to us as the gospel of the beautiful, and still more of the tasteful and the pleasing we found out the general sense and fancied that with such interpretations we should go on the more securely as we regarded it no small happiness to draw from the same fountain from which winkelmann had allayed his earliest thirst no greater good fortune can befall a city than when several educated men like-minded in what is good and right live together in it Leipzig had this advantage and enjoyed it the more peacefully, as so many differences of judgment had not yet manifested themselves. 
Huber, a print collector and well-experienced connoisseur, had furthermore the gratefully acknowledged merit of having determined to make the worth of German literature known to the French. Krieshoff, an amateur with a practiced eye, who, as the first of the whole society of art, might regard all collections as his own. Winkler, who much loved to share with others the intelligent delight he cherished for his treasures, many more who were added to the list all lived and labored with one feeling and often as i was permitted to be present when they examined works of art i do not remember that a dispute ever arose the school from which the artist had proceeded the time in which he lived the peculiar talent which nature had bestowed on him and the degree of excellence to which he had brought it in his performances were always fairly considered there was no predilection for spiritual or temporal subjects, for landscapes or for city views, for animate or inanimate. question was always about the accordance with art. Now, although from their situation, mode of thought, abilities and opportunities, these amateurs and collectors inclined more to the Dutch school, yet, while the eye was practiced on the endless merits of the northwestern artist, a look of reverential longing was always turned towards the southeast. And so the university, where I neglected the ends of both my family and myself, was to ground me in that in which I afterwards found the greatest satisfaction of my life. The impression of these localities, too, in which I received such important inclements, has always remained to me most dear and precious. The old Pleissenburg, the rooms of the academy, but above all the abode of Oser, and no less the collections of Winkler and Richter, I have always vividly present before me. But a young man, who, while older persons are conversing with each other on subjects already familiar to them, is instructed only incidentally, and for whom the most difficult part of the business, that of rightly arranging all, yet remains, must find himself in a very painful situation. I, therefore, as well as others, looked about with longing for some new light, which was indeed to come to us from a man to whom we owed so much already. The mind can be highly delighted in two ways, by perception and conception. But the former demands a worthy object, which is not always at hand, and the proportionate culture, which one does not immediately attain. Conception, on the other hand, requires only susceptibility. It brings its subject matter with it, and is itself the instrument of culture. Hence that beam of light was most welcome to us, which that most excellent thinker brought down to us through dark clouds. One must be a young man to render present to oneself the effect which Lessing's Laocoon produced upon us by transporting us out of the region of scanty perceptions into the open fields of thought. The ut pictura poesis, so long misunderstood, was at once laid aside. The difference between plastic and speaking art was made clear. The summits of the two now appeared sundered, however near their bases might border on each other. The plastic artist was to keep himself within the bounds of the beautiful. If the artist of language, who cannot dispense with the significant of any kind, is permitted to ramble abroad beyond them. Footnote. Bildindi und Redindi Kunst. The expression, quote, speaking art, end quote, is used to produce a corresponding antithesis, though, quote, belles lettres, would be the ordinary rendering. End quote. End of note. The former labors for the outer self, which is satisfied only by the beautiful, the latter for the imagination, which may even reconcile itself to the ugly. All the consequences of this splendid thought were illumined to us as by a lightning flash. All the criticisms which had hitherto guided and judged was thrown away like a worn-out coat, we considered ourselves freed from all evil, and fancied we might venture to look down with some compassion upon the otherwise so splendid sixteenth century, when in German sculptures and poems they knew how to represent life only under the form of a fool hung with bells, 
death under the misformed shape of a rattling skeleton and the necessary and accidental evils of the world under the image of the caricatured devil what enchanted us most was the beauty of that thought that the ancestors had recognized death as the brother of sleep and had represented them similar even to confusion as becomes menachmi here we could first do high honor to the triumph of the beautiful and banish the ugly of every kind into the lower sphere of the ridiculous within the realm of art since it could not be utterly driven out of the world the splendor of such leading and fundamental conceptions appeared only to the mind upon which they exercise their infinite activity appears only to the age in which after being longed for they come forth at the right moment then do those at whose disposal such nourishment is placed fondly occupy whole periods of their lives with it and rejoice in a superabundant growth while men are not wanting meanwhile who resist such an effect on the spot nor others who afterwards haggle and cavil at its high meaning but as conception and perception mutually require each other i could not long work up these new thoughts without an infinite desire arising within me to see important works of art once in a way in a great number i therefore determined to visit dresden without delay i was not in want of the necessary cash but there were other difficulties to overcome which i needlessly increased still further through my whimsical disposition for i kept my purpose a secret from every one because i wished to contemplate the treasures of art there quite after my own way and as i thought to allow no one to perplex me besides this so simple a matter became more complicated by still another eccentricity we have weaknesses both by birth and by education and it may be questioned which of the two gives us the most trouble willingly as i made myself familiar with all sorts of conditions and many as had been my inducement to do so an excessive aversion from all inns had nevertheless been instilled into me by my father this feeling had taken firm root in him on his travels through italy france and germany although he seldom spoke in images and only called them to his aid when he was very cheerful yet he used often to repeat that he always fancied he saw a great cobweb spun across the gate of an inn so ingeniously that the insects could indeed fly in but that even the privileged wasps could not fly out again unplucked it seemed to him something horrible that one should be obliged to pay immoderately for renouncing one's habits and all that was dear to one in life and living after the manner of publicans and waiters he praised the hospitality of the olden time and reluctantly as he otherwise endured even anything unusual in the house he yet practised hospitality especially towards artists and virtuosi thus gossip sea-cats always had his quarters with us and abel the last musician who handled the viol de gamba with success and applause was well received and entertained with such youthful impressions which nothing had as yet rubbed off how could i have resolved to set foot in an inn in a strange city nothing would have been easier than to find quarters with good friends hofrath crable assessor hermann and others had often spoken to me about it already and even to these my trip was to remain a secret and i hit upon a most singular notion my next-door neighbor the industrious theologian whose eyes unfortunately constantly grew weaker and weaker had a relation in dresden a shoemaker with whom from time to time he corresponded for a long while already this man had been highly remarkable to me on account of his expressions and the arrival of one of his letters was always celebrated by us as a holiday the mode in which he replied to the complaints of his cousin who feared blindness was quite peculiar for he did not trouble himself about grounds of consolation which are always hard to find but the cheerful way in which he looked upon his own narrow poor toilsome life the merriment which he drew 
even from evils and inconveniences, the indestructible conviction that life is in itself, and on its own account a blessing, communicated itself to him who read the letter, and, for the moment at least, transposed him into a like mood. Enthusiastic as I was, I had often sent my compliments to this man, extolling his happy natural gift, and expressed the wish to become acquainted with him. All this being premised, nothing seemed to me more natural than to seek him out, to converse with him, nay, to lodge with him, and to learn to know him intimately. My good candidate, after some opposition, gave me a letter, written with difficulty to carry with me, and full of longing. I went to Dresden in the yellow coach, with my matriculation in my pocket. End of section 25The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1, by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, Section 26. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1 by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, section 26. I went in search of my shoemaker, and soon found him in the suburb Vorstadt. He received me in a friendly manner, sitting upon my stool, and said, smiling, after he had read the letter, I see from this, young sir, that you are a whimsical Christian. How so, master? I replied. No offense meant by whimsical, he continued. One calls every one so who is not consistent with himself. And I call you a whimsical Christian because you acknowledge yourself a follower of our Lord in one thing, but not in another. On my requesting him to enlighten me, he said further, It seems that your view is to announce glad tidings to the poor and lowly. That is good, and this imitation of the Lord is praiseworthy. But you should reflect, besides, that he rather sat down to table with prosperous rich folks, where there was good fare, and that he himself did not despise the sweet scent of the ointment, for which you will find the opposite in my house. This pleasant beginning put me at once in good humor, and we rallied each other for some time. His wife stood doubting how she should board and lodge such a guest. On this point, too, he had notions which referred not only to the Bible, but also to Gottfried's Chronicle, and when we were agreed that I was to stay, I gave my purse, such as it was, into the charge of my hostess, and requested her to furnish herself from it if anything should be necessary. When he would have declined it, and somewhat waggishly gave me to understand that he was not so burned out as he might appear, I disarmed him by saying, Even if it were only to change water into wine, such a well-tried domestic resource would not be out of place, since there are no more miracles nowadays. The hostess seemed to find my conduct less and less strange. We had soon accommodated ourselves to each other, and spent a very merry evening. He remained always the same, because all flowed from one source. His peculiarity was an apt common sense, which rested upon a cheerful disposition, and took delight in uniform habitual activity. That he should labor incessantly was his first and most necessary care. That he regarded everything else as secondary, this kept up his comfortable state of mind, and I must reckon him, before many others in the class of those who are called practical, unconscious philosophers. Footnote. Praktische Philosophen Bewustolz Weltwissen. It is impossible to give two substantives, as in the original, 
since this is affected by using first the word of greek then the word of german origin whereas we have but one translator end of footnote the hour when the gallery was to be opened appeared after having been expected with impatience i entered into this sanctuary and my astonishment surpassed every contemplation which i had formed this room returned into itself in which splendor and neatness reigned together with the deepest stillness the dazzling frames all nearer to the time in which they had been gilded the floor polished with beeswax the spaces more trodden by spectators than used by copyists imparted a feeling of solemnity unique of its kind which so much more resembled the sensation with which one treads a church as the adornments of so many a temple the objects of so much adoration seemed here again set up only for the sacred purpose of art i readily put up with the cursory description of my guide only i requested that i might be allowed to remain in the outer gallery here to my comfort i felt really at home i had already seen the works of several artists others i knew from engravings others by name i did not conceal this and i thus inspired my conductor with some confidence nay the rapture which i expressed at pieces where the pencil had gained the victory over nature delighted him for such were the things which principally attracted me and where the comparison with known nature must necessarily enhance the value of art when i again entered my shoemaker's house for dinner i scarcely believed my eyes for i fancied i saw before me a picture by olstadt so perfect that all it needed was to be hung up in the gallery the position of the objects the light the shadow the brownish tint of the hall the magical harmony everything that one admires in those pictures i here saw in reality it was the first time that i perceived in so high a degree the faculty which i afterwards exercised with more consciousness namely that of seeing nature with the eyes of this or that artist to whose works i had devoted a particular attention this faculty has afforded me much enjoyment but has also increased the desire zealously to abandon myself from time to time to the exercise of a talent which nature seemed to have denied me i visited the gallery at all permitted hours and continued to express too loudly the ecstasy with which i beheld many precious works I thus frustrated my laudable purpose of remaining unknown and unnoticed. And whereas only one of the unclerk keepers had hitherto had intercourse with me, the gallery inspector, Councillor Rydal, now also took notice of me, and called my attention to many things which seemed chiefly to lie within my sphere. I found this excellent man just as active and obliging then as when i afterwards saw him during many years and as he shows himself to this day his image has for me interwoven itself so closely with those treasures of art that i can never regard the two apart the resemblance of him has even accompanied me to italy where in many large and rich collections his presence would have been very desirable since even with strangers and unknown persons one cannot gaze on such works silently and without mutual sympathy nay since the first sight of them is rather adapted in the highest degree to open hearts toward each other i got there into conversation with a young man who seemed to be residing at dresden and to belong to some embassy he invited me to come in the evening to an inn where a lively company met and where by each one's paying a moderate reckoning one could pass some very pleasant hours i repaired thither but did not find the company and the waiter somewhat surprised me when he delivered the compliments of the gentleman who made the appointment with me by which the letter sent an excuse for coming somewhat later with the addition that i must not take offence at anything that might occur also that i should have nothing to pay beyond my own score i knew not what to make of these words my father's cobwebs came into my head 
and I composed myself to await whatever might befall. The company assembled. My acquaintance introduced me, and I could not be attentive long without discovering that they were aiming at the mystification of a young man who showed himself a novice by an obstreperous assuming deportment. I therefore kept very much on my guard, so that they might not find delight in selecting me as his fellow. At table this intention became more apparent to everybody except to himself. They drank more and more deeply, and when a vivid in honor of sweethearts was started, everyone solemnly swore that there should never be another out of those glasses. They flung them behind them, and this was a signal for far greater follies. At last I withdrew very quietly, and the waiter, while demanding quite a moderate amount, requested me to come again, as they did not go on so wildly every evening. I was far from my lodging, and it was near midnight when I reached them. I found the doors unlocked, everybody was in bed, and one lamp illuminated the narrow domestic household, where my eye, more and more practiced, immediately perceived the finest picture by Schalken, from which I should not tear myself away, so that it banished me from all sleep. The few days of my residence in Dresden were slowly devoted to the picture gallery. The antiquities still stood in the pavilion of the great garden, but I declined seeing them, as well as all the other precious things which Dresden contained, being but too full of the conviction that even in and about the collection of paintings much must yet remain hidden from me. Thus I took the excellence of the Italian masters more on trust and in faith than by pretending to any insight into them. What I could not look upon as nature, but in the place of nature and compare with a known object, was without effect upon me. It is the material impression which makes the beginning even to every more elevated taste. With my shoemaker I lived on very good terms. He was witty and varied enough, and we often outvied each other in merry conceits. Nevertheless, a man who thinks himself happy, and desires others to do the same, makes us discontented. Indeed, the repetition of such sentiments produces weariness. I found myself well occupied, entertained, excited, but by no means happy, and the shoes from his last would not fit me. We parted, however, as the best friends, and even my hostess, on my departure was not satisfied with me. Shortly before my departure, something else very pleasant was to happen, by the mediation of that young man who wished to somewhat regain his credit with me. I was introduced to the director von Hagedorn, who with great kindness showed me his collection, and was highly delighted with the enthusiasm of the young lover of art. He himself, as becomes a connoisseur, was quite peculiarly in love with the pictures which he possessed, and therefore seldom found in others an interest such as he wished. It gave him particular satisfaction that I was so excessively pleased with the picture of Schwanefeld, and that I was not tired of praising and extolling it in every single part for landscapes which again reminded me of the beautiful clear sky under which i had grown up of the vegetable luxuriance of those spots and of whatever other favors a warmer climate offers to man were just the things that most affected me by the imitation while they awakened in me a longing resemblance these delightful experiences preparing both mind and sense for true art were nevertheless interrupted and damped by one of the most melancholy sights, by the destroyed and desolate condition of so many of the streets of Dresden through which I took my way. The Mohrenstrasse in ruins, the church Kruskirke of the cross, with its shattered tower, impressed themselves deeply upon me and still stand like a gloomy spot in my imagination. From the cupola of the Lady Church, Frankirke, 
i saw these pitiable ruins scattered about amid the beautiful order of the city here the clerk commended to me the art of the architect who had already fitted up church and cupola for so desirable an event and had built them bomb-proof the good sacristan then pointed out to me the ruins on all sides and said doubtfully and laconically the enemy hath done this at last though very loath i returned to leipzig and found my friends who were not used to such digressions in me in great astonishment busied with all sorts of conjectures as to what might be the import of my mysterious journey when upon this i told them my story quite in order they declared it was only a made-up tale and sagaciously tried to get at the bottom of the riddle which i had been waggish enough to conceal under my shoemaker lodgings but could they have looked into my heart they would have discovered no waggery there for the truth of an old proverb quote, he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow end quote, had struck me with all its force and the more i struggled to arrange and appropriate to myself what i had seen the less i succeeded i had at last to content myself with the silent after operation ordinarily life carried me away again and i at last felt myself quite comfortable when a friendly intercourse improvement in branches of knowledge which were suitable to me and a certain practice of the hand engaged me in a manner less important but more in accordance with my strength very pleasant and wholesome for me was the connection i formed with the Breitkopf family bernhard christoph Breitkopf, the proper founder of the family who had come to leipzig as a poor journeyman printer was yet living and occupied the golden bear a respectable house in the new new market with gottsched as an inmate the son johann gottlob emmanuel had already been long married and was the father of many children they thought they could not spend a part of their considerable wealth better than in putting up opposite the first house a large new one the silver bear which they built higher and more expensive than the original house itself just at the time of the building i became acquainted with the family the eldest son who might have been some years older than i was a well-formed young man devoted to music and practiced to play skillfully on both the piano and the violin the second a true good soul likewise musical enlivened the concerts which were often got up no less than his elder brother they were both kindly disposed towards me as well as their parents and sisters i lent them a helping hand during the building up and the finishing the furnishing and the moving in and thus formed a conception of much that belongs to such an affair i also had an opportunity of seeing oser's instructions put in practice in the new house which i had thus seen erected i was often a visitor we had many pursuits in common and the eldest son set some of my songs to music which when printed bore his name but not mine and have been little known i have selected the best and inserted them among my other little poems the father had invented or perfected musical type he granted me the use of a fine library which related principally to the origin and progress of printing and thus i gained some knowledge in that department i found there moreover good copper plates which exhibited antiquity and advanced on this side also my studies which were still further promoted by the circumstances that a considerable collection of casts had fallen into disorder in moving i set them right again as well as i could and in doing so was compelled to search leeper and other authorities a physician dr reichel likewise an inmate of the house i consulted from time to time when i felt if not sick yet unwell and thus we led together a quiet pleasant life i was now to enter into another sort of connection in this house for the copper plate engraver stock had moved into the attic he was a native of nuremberg a very industrious man and in his labors precise and methodical he also like geyser engraved 
after ulcer's designs larger and smaller plates which came more and more into vogue for novels and poems he etched very neatly so that his work came out of the aqua fortis almost finished and but little touching up remained to be done with the graver which he handled very well he made an exact calculation how long the plate would occupy him and nothing could call him off from his work if he had not completed the daily task he had set himself thus he sat working by a broad table by the great gable a window in a very neat and orderly chamber where his wife and two daughters afforded him a domestic society of these last one is happily married and the other is an excellent artist they have continued my friends all my life long i now divided my time between the upper and lower stories and attached myself much to the man who together with his persevering industry possessed an excellent humor and a good nature itself the technical neatness from this branch of art charmed me and i associated myself with him to execute something of the kind my predilection was again directed towards landscape which while it amused me in my solitary walks seemed in itself more attainable and more comprehensible for works of art than the human figure which discouraged me under his direction therefore i etched after thaley and others various landscapes which although executed by an unpractised hand produced some effect and were well received the grounding parenthesis varnishing in parenthesis of the plates and putting into the lights the etching at last the biting with aqua fortis gave me variety of occupation and soon got so far that i could assist my master in many things i did not lack the attention necessary for the biting and i seldom failed in anything but i had not care enough in guarding against the deleterious vapors which are generated on such occasions and these may have contributed to the maladies which afterwards troubled me for so long amid such labors lest anything could be left untried i often made woodcuts also i prepared various little printing blocks after french patterns and many of them were found fit for use let me here make mention of some other men who resided in leipzig or tarried there for a short time weiss the custom-house collector of the district in his best years cheerful friendly and obliging was loved and esteemed by us we could not indeed allow his theatrical pieces to be models throughout but we suffered ourselves to be carried away by them and his operas set to music by hiller in an easy style gave us much pleasure schiebler of hamburg pursued the same track in his lussard and dariolette was likewise favored by us eichenberg a handsome young man but little older than we were distinguished himself advantageously among the students zacharia was pleased to spend some weeks with us and being introduced by his brother dined every day with us at the same table we rightly deemed it an honor to gratify our guest in turn by a few extra dishes a richer dessert and choicer wine for as a tall well-formed comfortable man he did not conceal his love of good eating lessing came at a time when we had i know not what in our heads it was our good pleasure to go nowhere on his account nay even to avoid the places to which he came probably because we thought ourselves too good to stand at a distance and could make no pretension to obtain a closer intimacy with him this momentary absurdity which however is nothing rare in presuming and freakish youth proved indeed its own punishment in the sequel for i have never set eyes on that eminent man who was most highly esteemed by me notwithstanding all our efforts relative to art and antiquity we each of us always had winkelmann before our eyes whose ability was acknowledged in his country with enthusiasm we read his writings diligently and tried to make ourselves acquainted with the circumstances under which he had written the first of them we found in them many views which seemed to have originated with ulcer even jests and whims after his fashion 
and we did not rest until we had formed some general conception of the occasion on which these remarkable and sometimes so enigmatical writings had arisen, though we were not very accurate, for youth likes better to be excited than instructed. And it was not the last time that I was to be indebted to Sibylline Leaves for an important step in cultivation. End of section 26The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1, by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, Section 27. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1, by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford. Section 27 It was then a fine period in literature, when eminent men were yet treated with respect, although the disputes of Clotes and Lessing's controversies already indicated that this epoch would soon close. Winkelmann enjoyed an universal unassailed reverence, and it is known how sensitive he was with regard to anything public which did not seem commensurate with his deeply felt dignity. All the periodical publications joined in his praise. The better class of tourists came back from him instructed and enraptured, and the new views which he gave extended themselves over science and life. The Prince of Dessau had raised himself up to a similar degree of respect. Young and well and nobly minded, he had on his travels and at other times shown himself truly desirable. Winkelmann was in the highest degree delighted with him, and whenever he mentioned him, loaded him with the handsomest epithets. The laying out of a park, then unique, the taste for architecture, which von Ermensdorf supported by his activity, everything spoke in favor of a prince who while in his shining example for the rest gave promise of a golden age for his servants and subjects we young people now learned with rejoicings that winkelmann would return back from italy visit his princely friend call on oser by the way and so come within our sphere of vision we made no pretensions to speaking with him but we hoped to see him and as that time of life one willingly changes every occasion into a party of pleasure we had already agreed upon a journey to dessau where in a beautiful spot made glorious by art in a land well governed and at the same time externally adorned we thought to lie in wait now here now there in order to see with our own eyes these men so highly exalted above us walking about Oser himself was quite elated if he only thought of it, and the news of Winkelmann's death fell down into the midst of us, like a thunderbolt from a clear sky. I still remember the place where I first heard it. It was in the court of Pleissenburg, not far from the little gate through which one used to go up to Oser's residence. One of my fellow pupils met me and told me that Oser was not to be seen, with the reason why. This monstrous event footnote winkelmann was assassinated translator produced a monstrous effect there was an universal mourning and lamentation and winkelmann's untimely death sharpened the attention paid to the value of his life perhaps indeed the effect of his activity if he had continued it to a more advanced age would probably not have been so great as it now necessarily became when, like many other extraordinary men, he was distinguished by fate through a strange and calamitous end. Now, while I was infinitely lamenting the death of Winkelmann, I did not think that I should soon find myself in the case of being apprehensive about my own life, since during all these events my bodily condition had not taken the most favorable turn. I had already brought with me from home a certain touch of hypochondria, which in this new sedentary and lounging life was rather increased than diminished. The pain in my chest, which I had felt from time to time ever since the accident at Ostadt, and which after a fall from horseback had precipitously increased, made me dejected. 
By my unfortunate diet I destroyed my powers of digestion. The heavy Merseburg beer clouded my brain. Coffee, which gave me a particularly melancholy tone, especially when taken with milk after dinner, paralyzed my bowels and seemed completely to suspend their functions, so that I experienced great uneasiness on this account. Yet, without being able to embrace a resolution of a more rational mode of life, my natural disposition, supported by the sufficient strength of youth, fluctuated between the extremes of unrestrained gaiety and melancholy discomfort. Moreover, the epoch of cold water bathing, which was unconditionally recommended, had begun. One was to sleep on a hard bed, only slightly covered, by which all the usual perspiration was suppressed. These and other follies, in consequence of some misunderstood suggestions of Rousseau, would, it was promised, bring us near to nature, and deliver us from the corruption of morals. Now all the above, without discrimination applied with injudicious alternation, were felt by many most injuriously and I irritated my happy organization to such a degree that the particular systems contained within it necessarily broke out at last into a complacency and revolution in order to save the whole. One night I awoke with a violent hemorrhage, and had just strength and presence of mind enough to waken my next-door neighbor. Dr. Reichel was called in, who assisted me in the most friendly manner, and thus for many days I wavered betwixt life and death and even the joy of a subsequent improvement was embittered by the circumstance that, during that eruption, a tumor had formed on the left side of the neck, which after the danger was past, now they first found time to notice. Recovery is, however, always pleasing and delightful, even though it takes place slowly and painfully, and, since nature had helped herself with me, I appeared now to have become another man for I had gained a greater cheerfulness of mind than I had known for a long time, and I was rejoiced to feel my inner self at liberty, although externally a wearisome affliction threatened me. But what particularly set me up at this time was to see how many eminent men had unreservedly given me their affection. Undeservedly, I say, for there was not one among them to whom I had not been troublesome through contradictory humors, not one whom I had not more than once wounded by morbid absurdity, nay, whom I had not stubbornly avoided for a long time from a feeling of my own injustice. All this was forgotten. They treated me in the most affectionate manner, and sought partly in my chamber, partly as soon as I could leave, to amuse and divert me. They drove out with me, entertained me at their country houses, and I seemed soon to recover. Among these friends, I name first of all Dr. Herrmann, then senator, afterwards burgermeister at Leipzig. He was among those boarders with whom I had become acquainted through Schlosser, and one with whom an always equitable and enduring connection was maintained. One might well reckon him the most industrious of his academic fellow-citizens. He attended his lectures with the greatest regularity, and his private industry remained always the same. Step by step, without the slightest deviation, I saw him attain his doctor's degree, and then raise himself to the assessorship without anything of all this appearing arduous to him, or his having in the least hurried or been too late with anything. The gentleness of his character attracted me. His instructive conversation held me fast. Indeed, I really believe that I took delight in his methodical industry, especially for this reason because I thought, by acknowledgments and high esteem, to appropriate to myself at least a part of a merit of which I could by no means boast. He was just as regular in the exercise of his talents and the enjoyment of his pleasures as in his business. He played the harpsichord with great skill, drew from nature with great feeling, and stimulated me to do the same, when in his manner, on grey paper with black and white chalk, I used to copy many a willow plot on the place, and many a lovely nook of those still waters, and at the same time longingly to indulge in my fantasies. I knew how to meet my sometimes comical disposition with merry jests, 
and I remember many pleasant hours which we spent together when he invited me with mocking solemnity to a tete -a -tete supper, where with some dignity, by the light of waxen candles, we ate what they call a council hare, which had run into his kitchen as a perquisite of his place, and with many jokes in the manner of Bariche, were pleased to season the meat and heighten the spirit of the wine that this excellent man who is still constantly laboring in his respectable office rendered me the most faithful assistance during a disease of which there was indeed a foreboding but which had not been foreseen in its full extent that he bestowed every leisure hour upon me and by remembrances of former happy times contrived to brighten the gloomy moment i still acknowledge with the sincerest thanks and rejoice that after so long a time I can give them publicly. Beside this worthy friend, Groening of Bremen particularly interested himself in me. I had made his acquaintance only a short time before, and first discovered his good feelings toward me during my misfortune. I felt the value of this favor the more warmly, as no one is apt to seek a closer connection with invalids. He spared nothing to give me pleasure, to draw me away from musing on my situation, to hold up to my view and promise me recovery and a wholesome activity in the nearest future. How often had I been delighted in the progress of life to hear how this excellent man has in the weightiest affairs shown himself useful, and indeed a blessing to his native city. Here, too, it was that friend Horn uninterruptedly brought into action his love and attention. The whole Breitkopf household, the Stock family, and many others treated me like a near relative, and thus, through the goodwill of so many friendly persons, the feeling of my situation was soothed in the tenderest manner. I must here, however, make particular mention of a man with whom I first became acquainted at this time, and whose instructive conversation so far blinded me to the miserable state in which I was, that I actually forgot it. This was longer, afterwards librarian at Wolfenbüttel, Eminently learned and instructed, he was delighted at my voracious hunger after knowledge, which, with the irritability of sickness, now broke out into a perfect fever. He tried to calm me by perspicuous summaries, and I have been very much indebted to his acquaintance, short as it was, since he understood how to guide me in various ways, and made me attentive whither I had to direct myself at the present moment. I felt all the more obliged to this important man, as my intercourse exposed him to some danger, for when, after Barish, he got the situation of tutor to the young Count Lindenau, the father made it an express condition with the new mentor that he should have no intercourse with me. Curious to become acquainted with such a dangerous subject, he frequently found means of meeting me indirectly. I soon gained his affection, and he, more prudent than Barish, called for me by night. We went walking together, conversed on interesting things, and at last I accompanied him to the very door of his mistress, for even this extremely serene, earnest, scientific man had not kept free from the toils of a very amiable lady. German literature, and with it my own poetical undertakings, had already for some time become strange to me, and, as is usually the result in such an autodidactic circular course, I turned back towards the beloved ancients who still constantly, like distant blue mountains, distinct in their outlines and masses, but indiscernible in their parts and internal relations, bounded the horizon of my intellectual wishes. I made an exchange with Langer, in which I at last played the part of Glaucus and Diomedes. I gave up to him whole baskets of German poets and critics, and received in return a number of Greek authors, the reading of whom was to give me recreation, even during the most tedious convalescence. The confidence which new friends repose in each other usually develops itself by degrees. Common occupation and tastes are the first things in which a mutual harmony shows itself. Then the mutual communication generally extends over past and present passions, especially over love affairs. But it is a lower depth which opens itself, if the connection is to be perfected. The religious sentiments, 
the affairs of the heart which relate to the imperishable are the things which both establish the foundation and adorn the summit of a friendship the christian religion was fluctuating between its own historically positive base and a pure deism which grounded on morality was in its turn to lay the foundation of ethics the diversity of characters and modes of thought here showed itself in infinite gradations especially when a leading difference was brought into play by the question arising as to how great a share reason and how great a share the feelings could and should have in such convictions the most lively and ingenious men showed themselves in this instance like butterflies who quite regardless of their caterpillar state throw away the chrysalis veil in which they have grown up to their organic perfection others more honestly and modestly minded might be compared to the flowers which after they unfold themselves to the most beautiful bloom yet do not tear themselves from the root from the mother stock nay rather through this family connection first bring the desired fruit to maturity of this latter case was langer for although a learned man and eminently versed in books he would yet give the bible a peculiar preeminence over the other writings which have come down to us and regard it as a document from which alone he could prove our moral and spiritual pedigree he belonged to those who cannot conceive an immediate connection with the great god of the universe with a capital g a mediation therefore was necessary for him an analogy to which he thought he could find everywhere in earthly and heavenly things his discourse which was pleasing and consistent easily found a hearing with a young man who separated from worldly things by an annoying illness found it highly desirable to turn the activity of his mind towards the heavenly grounded as i was in the bible all that was wanted was merely the faith to explain as divine that which i had hitherto esteemed in human fashion a belief the easier for me since i had made my first acquaintance with that book as a divine one to a sufferer to one who felt himself delicate nay weak the gospel was therefore welcome and even though langer with all his faith was at the very time a very sensible man and firmly maintained that one should not let the feelings prevail should not let oneself be led astray into mysticism i could not have managed to occupy myself with the new testament without feeling and enthusiasm in such conversations we spent much time and he grew so fond of me as an honest and well-prepared proselyte that he did not scruple to sacrifice to me many of the hours destined for his fair one and even to run the risk of being betrayed and looked upon unfavorably by his patron like Berish. i returned his affection in the most grateful manner and if what he did for me would have been of value at any time i could not but regard it in my present condition as worthy of the highest honor but as when the concert of our souls is most spiritually attuned the rude shrieking tones of the world usually break in most violently and boisterously and the contrast which has gone on exercising a secret control affects so much the more sensibly when it comes forward all at once thus was i not to be dismissed from the peripatetic school of my langer which having first witnessed an event strange at least for leipzig namely a tumult which the students excited and that on the following pretense some young people had quarrelled with the city soldiers and the affair had not gone off without violence many of the students combined to revenge the injuries inflicted the soldiers resisted stubbornly and the advantage was not on the side of the very discontented academic citizens it was now said that respectable persons had commended and rewarded the conquerors for their valiant resistance and by this the youthful feeling of honor and revenge was mightily excited it was publicly said that on the next evening windows would be broken in and some friends who brought me word that this was actually taking place were obliged to carry me there for youth and the multitude are always attracted by danger and tumult 
there really began a strange spectacle the otherwise open street was lined on one side with men who quite quiet without noise or movement were waiting to see what would happen about a dozen young fellows were walking singly up and down the empty sidewalk with the greatest apparent composure but as soon as they came opposite the marked house they threw stones at the windows as they passed by and this repeatedly as they returned backwards and forwards as long as the panes would rattle just as quietly as this was done all at last dispersed and the affair had no further consequences with such a ringing echo of university exploits i left leipzig in the september of seventeen sixty eight in a comfortable hired coach and in the company of some respectable persons of my acquaintance in the neighborhood of our stadt, i thought of that previous accident but i could not forebode that which many years afterwards would threaten me from thence with still greater danger just as little as in gotha where we had the castle shown to us i could think in the great hall adorned with stucco figures that so much favor and affection would befall me on that very spot the nearer i approached my native city the more i recalled to myself doubtingly the circumstances prospects and hopes with which i had left home and it was with a very disheartening feeling that i now returned as it were like one shipwrecked yet since i had not very much with which to reproach myself i contrived to compose myself tolerably well however the welcome was not without emotion the great vivacity of my nature excited and heightened by sickness caused an impassioned scene i might have looked worse than i myself knew since for a long time i had not consulted a looking-glass and who does not become used to himself suffice it to say they silently resolved to communicate many things to me only by degrees and before all things to let me have some repose both bodily and mental End of section 27。The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume One, by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, Section 28. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1, by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, Section 28. Eighth Book, Part 4 My sister immediately associated herself with me, and, as previously from her letters, so could I now more in detail and accurately understand the circumstances and situation of the family. My father had, after my departure, applied all his didactic taste to my sister, and in a house completely shut up, rendered secure by peace, and even cleared of lodgers, he had cut off from her almost every means of looking about and finding some recreation abroad. She had, by turns, to pursue and work at French, Italian, and English, besides which he compelled her to practice a great part of the day on the harpsichord. Nor was her writing to be neglected, and I had already remarked that he had directed her correspondence with me, and had let his doctrines come to me through her pen. My sister was, and still continued to be, an undefinable being, the most singular mixture of strength and weakness, of stubbornness and pliability, which qualities operated now united, now isolated by will and inclination. Thus she had, in a manner which seemed to me fearful, turned the hardness of her character against her father whom she did not forgive for having in these three years hindered or embittered to her so many innocent joys and of his good and excellent qualities she would not acknowledge even one 
she did all he commanded and arranged but in the most unamiable manner in the world she did it in the established routine but nothing more and nothing less not from love or a desire to please did she accommodate herself to anything so that this was one of the first things about which my mother complained to me in private but since love was as essential to my sister as to any human being she turned her affection wholly on me her care in nursing and entertaining me absorbed all her time her female companions who were swayed by her without her intending it had likewise to contrive all sorts of things to be pleasing and consolatory to me she was inventive in cheering me up and even developed some germs of comical humour which i had never known in her and which became her very well there soon arose between us a coterie language by which we could converse before all people without their understanding us and she often used this gibberish with great pertness in the presence of our parents my father was personally tolerably comfortable he was in good health spent a great part of the day in the instruction of my sister went on with the description of his travels and was longer in tuning his lute than in playing on it he concealed at the same time as well as he could his vexation at finding instead of a vigorous active son who ought now to take his degree and run through the prescribed course of life an invalid who seemed to suffer still more in soul than in body he did not conceal his wish that they should be expeditious with my cure but one was forced to be specially on one's guard in his presence against hypochondriacal expressions because he could then become passionate and bitter my mother by nature very lively and cheerful spent under these circumstances very tedious days her little housekeeping was soon provided for the good woman's mind inwardly never unoccupied wished to find an interest in something and that which was nearest at hand was religion which she embraced the more fondly as her most eminent female friends were cultivated and hearty worshippers of god at the head of these stood fraulein von plettenberg she is the same person from whose conversations and letters arose the confessions of a beautiful soul which are found inserted in wilhelm meister she was slenderly formed of the middle size a hearty natural demeanour had been made still more pleasing by the manners of the world and the court a very neat attire reminded of the dress of the helmhut women her serenity and peace of mind never left her she looked upon her sickness as a necessary element of her transient earthly existence she suffered with the greatest patience and in painless intervals was lively and talkative her favourite namely perhaps her only conversation was on the moral experiences which a man who observes himself can form in himself to which was added the religious views which in a very graceful manner no with genius came under her consideration as natural and supernatural it scarcely needs more to recall back to the friends of such representations that complete delineation composed from the very depths of her soul owing to the very peculiar course she had taken from her youth upwards the distinguished rank in which she had been born and educated the liveliness and originality of her mind she did not agree very well with the other ladies who had set out upon the same road to salvation frau griesbach the chief of them seemed too severe too dry too learned she knew thought comprehended more than the others who contented themselves with the development of their feelings and she was therefore burdensome to them because every one neither could nor would carry with her so great an apparatus on the road to bliss 
but for this reason most of them were indeed somewhat monotonous since they confined themselves to a certain terminology which might well have been compared to that of the later sentimentalists Fräulein von klettenberg guided her way between both extremes and seemed with some self-complacency to see her own reflections in the image of Karl Zindendorf, whose opinions and actions bore witness to a higher birth and more distinguished rank. Now she found in me what she needed, a lively young creature striving after an unknown happiness, who, although he could not think himself an extraordinary sinner, yet found himself in no comfortable condition and was perfectly healthy neither in body nor soul she was delighted with what nature had given me as well as with much that i had gained for myself and if she conceded to me many advantages this was by no means humiliating to her for in the first place she never thought of emulating one of the male sex and secondly she believed that in regard to religious culture she was very much in advance of me my disquiet my impatience my striving my seeking investigating musing and wavering she interpreted in her own way and did not conceal from me her conviction but assured me in plain terms that all this proceeded from my having no reconciled god now i had believed from my youth upwards that i stood on very good terms with my god nay i even fancied to myself according to various experiences that he might even be in arrears to me and i was daring enough to think that i had something to forgive him this presumption was grounded on my infinite good will to which as it seemed to me he should have given better assistance it may be imagined how often i got into disputes on this subject with my friend which however always terminated in the friendliest way and often like my conversations with the old rector with the remark that i was a foolish fellow for whom many allowances must be made i was much troubled with the tumour in my neck as the physician and surgeon wished first to disperse this excrescence afterwards as they said to draw it to a head and at last thought it best to open it so for a long time i had to suffer more from inconvenience than pain although towards the end of the cure the continual touching with lunar caustic and other corrosive substances could not but give me very disagreeable prospects for every fresh day the physician and surgeon both belonged to the pious separatists although both were of highly different natural characters the surgeon a slender well-built man of easy and skilful hand was unfortunately somewhat hectic but endured his condition with truly christian patience and did not suffer his disease to perplex him in his profession the physician was an inexplicable sly-looking fair spoken and besides an abstruse man who had quite won the confidence of the pious circle being active and attentive he was consoling to the sick but more than by all this he extended his practice by the gift of showing in the background some mysterious medicines prepared by himself of which no one could speak since with us the physicians were strictly prohibited from making up their own prescriptions with certain powders which may have been some kind of digestive he was not so reserved but that powerful salt which could only be applied in the greatest danger was only mentioned among believers although no one had yet seen it or traced its effects to excite and strengthen our faith in the possibility of such an universal remedy the physician wherever he found any susceptibility had recommended certain chemico-alchemical books to his patients and given them to understand that by one's own study of them one could well attain this treasure for oneself 
which was the more necessary as the mode of its preparation both for physical and especially for moral reasons could not be well communicated nay that in order to comprehend produce and use this great work one must know the secrets of nature in connection since it was not a particular but an universal remedy and could indeed be produced under different forms and shapes my friend had listened to these enticing words the health of the body was too nearly allied to the health of the soul and could a greater benefit a greater mercy be shown towards others than by appropriating to oneself a remedy by which so many sufferings could be assuaged so many a danger averted she had already secretly studied Welling's opus mago cabalisticum for which however as the author himself immediately darkens and removes the light he imparts she was looking about for a friend who in this alternation of glare and gloom might bear her company it needed small incitement to inoculate me also with this disease i procured the work which like all writings of this kind could trace its pedigree in a direct line up to the neoplatonic school my chief labour in this book was most accurately to notice the obscure hints by which the author refers from one passage to another and thus promises to reveal what he conceals and to mark down on the margin the number of the page where such passages as should explain each other were to be found but even thus the book still remained dark and unintelligible enough except that one at last studied oneself into a certain terminology and by using it according to one's own fancy believed that one was at any rate saying if not understanding something the work mentioned before makes very honourable mention of its predecessors and we were incited to investigate those original sources themselves we turn to the works of theophrastus paracelsus and basilius valentinus as well as to those of helmont starkey and others whose doctrines and directions resting more or less on nature and imagination we endeavoured to see into and follow out I was particularly pleased with the Aria Catena Homeri, in which nature, though perhaps in fantastical fashion, is represented in a beautiful combination. And thus sometimes by ourselves, sometimes together, we employed much time on these singularities, and spent the evenings of a long winter, during which I was compelled to keep my chamber, very agreeably, since we three, my mother being included were more delighted with these secrets than we would have been at their elucidation in the meantime a very severe trial was preparing for me for a disturbed and one might even say for certain moments destroyed digestion excited such symptoms that in great tribulation i thought i should lose my life and none of the remedies applied would produce any further effect in this last extremity my distressed mother constrained the embarrassed physician with the greatest vehemence to come out with his universal medicine after a long refusal he hastened home at the dead of night and returned with a little glass of crystallized dry salt which was dissolved in water and swallowed by the patient it had a decidedly alkaline taste the salt was scarcely taken then my situation appeared relieved and from that moment the disease took a turn which by degrees led to my recovery i need not say how much this strengthened and heightened our faith in our physician and our industry to share in such a treasure my friend who without parents or brothers and sisters lived in a large well-situated house had already before this begun to purchase herself a little air furnace alembics and retorts of a moderate size and in accordance with the hints of velling and the significant signs of our physician and master 
operated principally on iron, in which the most healing powers were said to be concealed, if one only knew how to open it. And as the volatile salt which must be produced made a great figure in all the writings with which we were acquainted, so for these operations alkalis also were required, which, while they flowed away into the air, were to unite with these superterrestrial things, and at last produce, per se, a mysterious and excellent neutral salt. No sooner was I in some measure restored, and favoured by the change in the season, once more able to occupy my old gable chamber, than I also began to provide myself with a little apparatus. A small air furnace with a sand bath was prepared, and I very soon learned to change the glass alembics, with a piece of burning match cord, into vessels in which the different mixtures were to be evaporated. Now were the strange ingredients of the macrocosm and microcosm handled in an odd, mysterious manner, and before all I attempted to produce neutral salts in an unheard-of way. But what for a long time kept me busy most was the so-called licorcinicum, flint juice, which is made by melting down pure quartz flint with the proper proportion of alkali, whence results a transparent glass which melts away on exposure to the air and exhibits a beautiful clear fluidity. Whoever has once prepared this himself and seen it with his own eyes will not blame those who believe in a maiden earth and in the possibility of producing further effects upon it by means of it. I had become quite skilful in preparing this liquor silicum. The fine white flints which are found in the mine furnished a perfect material for it, and I was not wanting in the other requisites nor in diligence. But I wearied at last, because I could not but remark that the flinty substance was by no means so closely combined with the salt as I had philosophically imagined, for it very easily separated itself again. And this most beautiful mineral fluidity, which to my greatest astonishment had sometimes appeared in the form of an animal jelly, always deposited a powder which I was forced to pronounce the finest flint dust, but which gave not the least sign of anything productive in its nature from which one could have hoped to see this maiden earth pass into the maternal state. Strange and unconnected as these operations were, I yet learned many things from them. I paid strict attention to all the crystallizations that might occur, and became acquainted with the external forms of many natural things. And inasmuch as I well knew that in modern times chemical subjects were treated more methodically, I wished to get a general conception of them, although as a half adept I had very little respect for the apothecaries and all those who operated with common fire. However, the chemical compendium of Buahaba attracted me powerfully and led me on to read several of his writings in which, since moreover my tedious illness had inclined me towards medical subjects, I found an inducement to study also the aphorisms of this excellent man, which I was glad to stamp upon my mind and in my memory. Another employment, somewhat more human, and by far more useful for my cultivation at the moment, was reading through the letters which I had written home from Leipzig. Nothing reveals more with respect to ourselves than when we again see before us that which has proceeded from us years before, so that we can now consider ourselves as an object of contemplation. But of course I was as yet too young, and the epoch which was represented by those papers was still too near. As in our younger years we do not in general easily cast off a certain self-complacent conceit, 
this especially shows itself in despising what we have been but a little time before for while indeed we perceive as we advance from step to step that those things which we regard as good and excellent in ourselves and others do not stand their ground we think we can best extricate ourselves from this dilemma by ourselves throwing away what we cannot preserve so it was with me also for as in leipzig i had gradually learned to set little value on my childish labours so now my academical course seemed to me likewise of small account and i did not understand that for this very reason it must be of great value to me as it elevated me to a higher degree of observation and insight my father had carefully collected and sewed together the letters i had written to him as well as those to my sister nay he had even corrected them with attention and improved the mistakes both in writing and in grammar what first struck me in these letters was their exterior i was shocked at an incredible carelessness in the handwriting which extended from october seventeen sixty five to the middle of the following january but in the middle of march there appeared all at once a quite compressed orderly hand such as i used formerly to employ in writing for a prize my astonishment resolved itself into gratitude towards good geller who as i now well remembered whenever we handed in our essays to him represented to us in his hearty tone of voice that it was our sacred duty to practice our hand as much nay more than our style he repeated this as often as he caught sight of any scrawled careless writing on which occasion he often said that he would much like to make a good hand of his pupils the principal end in his instructions the more so as he had often remarked that a good hand led the way to a good style i could further notice that the french and english passages in my letters though not free from blunders were nevertheless written with facility and freedom these languages i had likewise continued to practise in my correspondence with george schlosser who was still at treptow and i had remained in constant communication with him by which i was instructed in many secular affairs for things did not always turn out with him quite as he had hoped and acquired an ever-increasing confidence in his earnest noble way of thinking another consideration which could not escape me in going over these letters was that my good father with the best intentions had done me a special mischief and had led me into that odd way of life into which i had fallen at last he had repeatedly warned me against card playing but frau hofrat Böhme, as long as she lived contrived to persuade me after her own fashion by declaring that my father's warnings were only against the abuse now as i likewise saw the advantages of it in society i readily submitted to being led by her i had indeed the sense of play but not the spirit of play i learned all the games easily and rapidly but i could never keep up the proper attention for a whole evening therefore however good a beginning i would make i invariably failed at the end and made myself and others lose through which i went off always out of humour either to the supper table or out of the company scarcely had madame Burma died who moreover had no longer kept me in practice during her tedious illness when my father's doctrine gained force i at first begged to be excused from joining the card tables and as they now did not know what else to do with me i became even more of a burden to myself than to others and declined the invitations which then became more rare and at last ceased altogether play which is much to be recommended to young people especially to those who incline to be practical and wish to look about in the world for themselves 
could never indeed become a passion with me, for I never got any farther, no matter how long I might have been playing. Had any one given me a general view of the subject, and made me observe how here certain signs, and more or less of chance, form a kind of material at which judgment and activity can exercise themselves, had any one made me see several games at once, I might sooner have become reconciled. With all this, at the time of which I am now speaking, I had, from the above considerations, come to the conviction that one should not avoid social games, but should rather strive after a certain skill in them. Time is infinitely long, and each day is a vessel into which a great deal may be poured, if one would actually fill it up. Thus variously I was occupied in my solitude, the more so as the departed spirits of the different tastes to which I had from time to time devoted myself had an opportunity to reappear. I then again took up drawing, and as I had always wished to labour directly from nature, or rather from reality, I made a picture of my chamber with its furniture and the persons who were in it. And when this no more amused me, I represented all sorts of town tales which were told at the time, and in which interest was taken. All this was not without character and a certain taste, but unfortunately the figures lacked proportion and the proper vigour besides which the execution was extremely misty. My father, who continued to take pleasure in these things, wished to have them more distinct, wanting everything to be finished and properly completed. He therefore had them mounted and surrounded with ruled lines. Nay, the painter Morgenstern, his domestic artist, the same who afterwards made himself known and indeed famous by his church views, had to insert the perspective lines of the rooms and chambers, which then indeed stood in pretty harsh contrast with those cloudy-looking figures. In this manner he thought he would make me gain greater accuracy, and to please him I drew various objects of still life in which, since the original stood as patterns before me, I could work with more distinctness and precision. At last I took it into my head to etch once more. I had composed a tolerably interesting landscape, and felt myself very happy when I could look out for the old receipts given me by Stock, and could at my work call to mind those pleasant times. I soon bit the plate, and had a proof taken. Unluckily, the composition was without light and shade, and I now tormented myself to bring in both. But as it was not quite clear to me what was really the essential point, I could not finish. Up to this time, I had been quite well, after my own fashion. But now a disease attacked me which had never troubled me before. My throat, namely, had become completely sore, and particularly what is called the uvula, very much in flame. I could only swallow with great pain, and the physicians did not know what to make of it. They tormented me with gargles and hair pencils, but could not free me from my misery. At last it struck me that I had not been careful enough in the biting of my plates and that by often and passionately repeating it, I had contracted this disease, and always revived and increased it. To the physicians this cause was plausible, and very soon certain, on my leaving my etching and biting, and that so much the more readily as the attempt had by no means turned out well, and I had more reason to conceal than to exhibit my labours, for which I consoled myself the more easily, as I very soon saw myself free from the troublesome disease. 
upon this i could not refrain from the reflection that my similar occupations at leipzig might have greatly contributed to those diseases from which i had suffered so much it is indeed a tedious and withal a melancholy business to take too much care of ourselves and of what injures and benefits us but there is no question but that with the wonderful idiosyncrasy of human nature on the one side and the infinite variety in the mode of life and pleasure on the other it is a wonder that the human race has not worn itself out long ago human nature seems to possess a peculiar kind of toughness and many-sidedness since it subdues everything which approaches it or which it takes into itself and if it cannot assimilate at least makes it indifferent in case of any great excess indeed it must yield to the elements in spite of all resistance as the many endemic diseases and the effects of brandy convince us could we without being morbidly anxious keep watch over ourselves as to what operates favourably or unfavourably upon us in our complicated civil and social life and would we leave off what is actually pleasant to us as an enjoyment for the sake of the evil consequences we should thus know how to remove with ease many an inconvenience which with a constitution otherwise sound often troubles us more than even a disease unfortunately it is in dietetics as in morals we cannot see into a fault until we have got rid of it by which nothing is gained for the next fault is not like the preceding one and therefore cannot be recognized under the same form while i was reading over the letters which had been written to my sister from leipzig this remark among others could not escape me that from the very beginning of my academical course i had esteemed myself very clever and wise since as soon as i had learned anything i put myself in the place of the professor and so became didactic on the spot i was amused to see how i had immediately applied to my sister whatever gellert had imparted or advised in his lectures without seeing that both in life and in books a thing may be proper for a young man without being suitable for a young lady and we both together made merry over these mimicries the poems also which i had composed in leipzig were already too poor for me and they seemed to me cold dry and in respect of all that was meant to express the state of a human heart or mind too superficial this induced me now that i was to leave my father's house once more and go to a second university again to decree a great high auto da fe against my labours several commenced plays some of which had reached the third or the fourth act while others had only the plot fully made out together with many other poems the letters and papers were given over to the fire and scarcely anything was spared except the manuscript by Berisch, die Lane des Verliebten, and die Mitschuldigen, which latter play I constantly went on improving with peculiar affection, and as the piece was already complete, I again worked over the plot to make it more bustling and intelligible. Lessing, in the first two acts of his Minna, had set up an unattainable model of the way in which a drama should be developed and nothing was to me of greater importance than to thoroughly enter into his meaning and views the recital of whatever moved excited and occupied me at this time is already circumstantial enough but i must nevertheless recur to that interest with which super sensuous things had inspired me of which i once for all so far as might be possible undertook to form some notion i experienced a great influence from an important work that fell into my hands it was arnold's history of the church and of heretics 
this man is not merely a reflective historian but at the same time pious and feeling his sentiments chimed in very well with mine and what particularly delighted me in his work was that i received a more favourable notion of many heretics who had been hitherto represented to me as mad or impious the spirit of contradiction and the love of paradoxes are inherent in us all i diligently studied the different opinions and as i had often enough heard it said that every man has his own religion at last so nothing seemed more natural to me than that i should form mine too and this i did with much satisfaction the neo-platonism lay at the foundation the hermetical the mystical the cabalistic also contributed their share and thus i built for myself a world that looked strange enough i could well represent to myself a godhead which has gone on producing itself from all eternity but as production cannot be conceived without multiplicity, so it must of necessity have immediately appeared to itself as a second, which we recognize under the name of the sun. Now these two must continue the act of producing, and again appear to themselves in a third, which was just as substantial, living, and eternal as the whole. With these, however, the circle of the Godhead was complete, and it would not have been possible for them to produce another perfectly equal to them but since the work of production always proceeded they created a fourth which already fostered in himself a contradiction inasmuch as it was like them unlimited and yet at the same time was to be contained in them and bounded by them now this was lucifer to whom the whole power of creation was committed from this time and from whom all other beings were to proceed he immediately displayed his infinite activity by creating the whole body of angels all again after his own likeness unlimited but contained in him and bounded by him surrounded by such a glory he forgot his higher origin and believed that he could find himself in himself and from this first ingratitude sprang all that does not seem to us in accordance with the will and purposes of the godhead now the more he concentrated himself within himself the more painful must it have become to him as well as to all the spirits whose sweet uprising to their origin he had embittered and so that happened which is intimated to us under the form of the fall of the angels one part of them concentrated itself with lucifer the other turned itself again to its origin from this concentration of the whole creation for it had proceeded out of lucifer and was forced to follow him sprang all that we perceive under the form of matter which we figure to ourselves as heavy solid and dark but which since it is descended if not even immediately yet by filiation from the divine being is just as unlimited powerful and eternal as its sire and grandsire now the whole mischief if we may call it so having arisen merely through the one-sided direction of lucifer the better half was indeed wanting to this creation for it possessed all it is gained by concentration while it lacked all that can be effected by expansion alone and so the entire creation might have been destroyed by everlasting concentration become annihilated with its father lucifer and have lost all its claims to an equal eternity with the godhead this condition the Eloam contemplated for a time and they had their choice to wait for those eons in which the field would again have become clear and space would be left them for a new creation or if they would 
to seize upon that which existed already and supply the want according to their own eternity now they chose the latter and by their mere will supplied in an instant the whole want which the consequence of lucifer's undertaking drew after it they gave to the eternal being the faculty of expansion of moving towards them the peculiar pulse of life was again restored and lucifer himself could not avoid its effects this is the epoch when that appeared which we know as light and when that began which we are accustomed to designate by the word creation however much this multiplied itself by progressive degrees through the continually working vital power of the aloem still a being was wanting who might be able to restore the original connection with the godhead and thus man was produced who in all things was to be similar yea equal to the godhead but thereby in effect found himself once more in the situation of lucifer that of being at once unlimited and limited and since this contradiction was to manifest itself in him through all the categories of existence and a perfect consciousness as well as a decided will was to accompany his various conditions it was to be foreseen that he must be at the same time the most perfect and the most imperfect the most happy and the most unhappy creature it was not long before he too completely acted the part of lucifer true ingratitude is the separation from the benefactor and thus that fall was manifest for the second time although the whole creation is nothing and was nothing but a falling from and returning to the original one easily sees how the redemption is not only decreed from eternity but is considered as eternally necessary nay that it must ever renew itself through the whole time of generation Footnote. das werden the state of becoming as distinguished from that of being the word which is most useful to the germans can never be rendered properly in english translator and existence in this view of the subject nothing is more natural than for the divinity himself to take the form of man which had already prepared itself as a veil and to share his fate for a short time in order by this assimilation to enhance his joys and alleviate his sorrows the history of all religions and philosophies teaches us that this great truth indispensable to man has been handed down by different nations in different times in various ways and even in strange fables and images in accordance with their limited knowledge enough if it only be acknowledged that we find ourselves in a condition which even if it seems to drag us down and oppress us yet gives us opportunity nay even makes it our duty to raise ourselves up and to fulfil the purposes of the godhead in this manner that while we are compelled on the one hand to concentrate ourselves we on the other hand do not omit to expand ourselves in regular pulsation Footnote. if we could make use of some such verbs as in self and unself we should more accurately render this passage translator end of section twenty eight The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1, by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, Section 29. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1, by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, Section 29. Ninth Book, Part 1 reader's note in the following paragraph goethe is quoting another writer 
the heart is often affected moreover to the advantage of different but especially of social and refined virtues and the more tender sentiments are excited and unfolded in it many touches in particular will impress themselves which give the young reader an insight into the more hidden corner of the human heart and its passions a knowledge which is more worth than all latin and greek and of which ovid was a very excellent master but yet it is not on this account that the classic poets and therefore ovid are placed in the hands of youth we have received from a kind creator a variety of mental powers to which we must not neglect giving their proper culture in our earliest years and which cannot be cultivated either by logic or metaphysics latin or greek we have an imagination for which since it should not seize upon the very first conceptions that chance to present themselves we ought to place the fittest and most beautiful images and thus accustom and practise the mind to recognise and love the beautiful everywhere and in nature itself under its determined true and also in its finer features a multitude of conceptions and general knowledge is necessary to us as well for the sciences as for daily life which can be learned out of no compendium our feelings affections and passions should be advantageously developed and purified readers note end of quotation this significant passage which is found in the universal german library was not the only one of its kind similar principles and similar views manifested themselves in many directions they made upon us lively youths a very great impression which had the more decided effect as it was strengthened besides by wieland's example for the works of his second brilliant period clearly showed that he had formed himself according to such maxims and what more could we desire philosophy with its abstruse questions was set aside the classic languages the acquisition of which is accompanied by so much drudgery one saw thrust into the background the compendiums about the sufficiency of which hamlet had already whispered a word of caution into our ears came more and more into suspicion we were directed to the contemplation of an active life which we were so fond of leading and to the knowledge of the passions which we partly felt partly anticipated in our own bosoms and which if though they had been rebuked formerly now appeared to us as something important and dignified because they were to be the chief object of our studies and the knowledge of them was extolled as the most excellent means of cultivating our mental powers besides such a mode of thought was quite in accordance with my own conviction nay with my poetical mode of treatment i therefore without opposition after i had thwarted so many good designs and seen so many fair hopes vanish reconciled myself to my father's intention of sending me to strasbourg where i was promised a cheerful gay life while i should prosecute my studies and at last take my degree in spring i felt my health but still more my youthful spirits restored and once more longed to be out of my father's house though with reasons far different from those on the first time the pretty chambers and spots where i had suffered so much had become disagreeable to me and with my father himself there could be no pleasant relation i could not quite pardon him for having manifested more impatience than was reasonable at the relapse of my disease and at my tedious recovery nay for having instead of comforting me by forbearance frequently expressed himself in a cruel manner about that which lay in no man's hand as if it depended only on the will and he too 
was in various ways hurt and offended by me for young people bring back from the university general ideas which indeed is quite right and good but because they fancy themselves very wise in this they apply them as a standard to the objects that occur which must then for the most part lose by the comparison thus i had gained a general notion of architecture and of the arrangement and decoration of houses and imprudently in conversation had applied this to our own house my father had designed the whole arrangement of it and carried out its construction with great perseverance and considering that it was to be exclusively a residence for himself and his family nothing could be objected to it in this taste also very many of the houses in frankfurt were built an open staircase ran up through the house and touched upon large ante-rooms which might very well have been chambers themselves as indeed we always passed the fine season in them but this pleasant cheerful existence for a single family this communication from above to below became the greatest inconvenience as soon as several parties occupied the house as we had but too well experienced on the occasion of the french quartering for that painful scene with the king's lieutenant would not have happened nay my father would even have felt all those disagreeable matters less if after the leipzig fashion our staircase had run close along the side of the house and a separate door had been given to each story this style of building i once praised highly for its advantages and showed my father the possibility of altering his staircase also whereat he got into an incredible passion which was the more violent as a short time before i had found fault with some scrolled looking-glass frames and rejected certain chinese hangings a scene ensued which indeed was again hushed up and smothered but it hastened my journey to the beautiful alsace which i accomplished in a newly contrived comfortable diligence without delay and in a short time i had alighted at the ghost geist tavern and hastened at once to satisfy my most earnest desire and to approach the minster which had long since been pointed out to me by fellow travellers and had been before my eyes for a great distance when i first perceived this colossus through the narrow lanes and then stood too near before it in the truly confined little square it made upon me an impression quite of its own kind which i being unable to analyse on the spot carried with me only indistinctly for this time as i hastily ascended the building so as not to neglect the beautiful moment of a high and cheerful sun which was to disclose to me at once the broad rich land and now from the platform i saw before me the beautiful country in which i should for a long time live and reside the handsome city the wide-spreading meadows around it thickly set and interwoven with magnificent trees that striking richness of vegetation which follows in the windings of the rhine marks its banks islands and eights nor is the level ground stretching down from the south and watered by the illa less adorned with varied green even westward towards the mountains there are many low grounds which afford quite as charming a view of wood and meadow growth just as the northern and more hilly part is intersected by innumerable little brooks which promote a rapid vegetation everywhere if one imagines between these luxuriantly outstretched meads between these joyously scattered groves all land adapted for tillage excellently prepared verdant and ripening and the best and richest spots marked by hamlets and farmhouses and this great and immeasurable plain prepared for man like a new paradise 
bounded far and near by mountains partly cultivated partly overgrown with woods he will then conceive the rapture with which i blessed my fate that it had destined me for some time so beautiful a dwelling-place such a fresh glance into a new land in which we are to abide for a time has still the peculiarity both pleasant and foreboding that the whole lies before us like an unwritten tablet as yet no sorrows and joys which relate to ourselves are recorded upon it this cheerful varied animated plain is still mute for us the eye is only fixed on the object so far as they are intrinsically important and neither affection nor passion has especially to render prominent this or that spot but a presentiment of the future already disquiets the young heart and an unsatisfied craving secretly demands that which is to come and may come and which at all events whether for good or ill will imperceptibly assume the character of the spot in which we find ourselves having descended the height i still tarried a while before the face of the venerable pile but what i could not quite clearly make out either the first or the following time was that i regarded this miracle as a monster which must have terrified me if it had not at the same time appeared to me comprehensible by its regularity and even pleasing in its finish yet i by no means busied myself with meditating on this contradiction but suffered a monument so astonishing quietly to work upon me by its presence i took small but well situated and pleasant lodgings on the north side of the fish market a fine long street where the everlasting motion came to the assistance of every unoccupied moment i then delivered my letters of introduction and found among my patrons a merchant who with his family was devoted to those pious opinions sufficiently known to me although as far as regarded external worship he had not separated from the church he was a man of intelligence withal and by no means hypocritical in his conduct the company of boarders which was recommended to me and indeed i to it was very agreeable and entertaining a couple of old maids had long kept up this boarding-house with regularity and good success there might have been about ten persons older and younger of these latter one named maya a native of lindau is most vividly present to my mind from his form and face he might have been considered one of the handsomest of men if at the same time he had not had something of the sloven in his whole appearance in like manner his splendid natural talents were marred by an incredible levity and his excellent temper by an unbounded dissoluteness he had an open jovial face rather more round than oval the organs of the senses the eyes nose mouth and ears could be called rich they showed a decided fullness without being too large his mouth was particularly charming owing to his curling lips and his whole physiognomy had the peculiar expression of a rake from the circumstance that his eyebrows met across his nose which in a handsome face always produces a pleasant expression of sensuality by his jovialness sincerity and good nature he made himself beloved by all his memory was incredible attention at the lectures was no effort for him he retained all he heard and was intellectual enough to take an interest in everything and this the more easily as he was studying medicine all his impressions remained vivid and his waggery in repeating the lectures and mimicking the professors often went so far that 
when he had heard three different lectures in one morning he would at the dinner-table interchange the professors with each other paragraph-wise and often even more abruptly which motley lecture frequently entertained us but often too became troublesome the rest were more or less polite steady serious people a pensioned knight of the order of st louis was one of these but the majority were students all really good and well disposed only they were not allowed to go beyond their usual allowance of wine that this should not be easily done was the care of our president one dr salzmann already in the sixties and unmarried he had attended this dinner-table for many years and maintained its good order and respectability he possessed a handsome property kept himself close and neat in his exterior even belonging to those who always go in shoes and stockings and with their hat under their arm to put on the hat was with him an extraordinary action he commonly carried an umbrella wisely reflecting that the finest summer days often bring thunderstorms and passing showers over the country with this man i talked over my design of continuing to study jurisprudence at strasbourg so as to be able to take my degree as soon as possible since he was exactly informed of everything i asked him about the lectures i should have to hear and what he generally thought of the matter to this he replied that it was not in strasbourg as in the german universities where they try to educate jurists in the large and learned sense of the term here in conformity with the relation towards france all was really directed to the practical and managed in accordance with the opinions of the french who readily stop at what is given they tried to impart to every one certain general principles and preliminary knowledge they compressed as much as possible and communicated only what was most necessary hereupon he made me acquainted with a man in whom as a repetent footnote repetent is one of a class of persons to be found in the german universities and who assist students in their studies they are somewhat analogous to the english tutors but not precisely for the latter render their aid before the recitation while the repetent repeats with the student in private the lectures he has previously heard from the professor hence his name which might be rendered repeater had we any corresponding class of men in england or america which would justify an english word american note great confidence was entertained which he very soon managed to gain from me also by way of introduction i began to speak with him on the subjects of jurisprudence and he wondered not a little at my swaggering for during my residence at leipzig i had gained more of an insight into the requisites for the laws than i have hitherto taken occasion to state in my narrative though all i had acquired could only be reckoned as a general encyclopedical survey and not as proper definite knowledge university life even if in the course of it we may not exactly have to boast of industry nevertheless affords endless advantages in every kind of cultivation because we are always surrounded by men who either possess or are seeking science so that even if unconsciously we are constantly drawing some nourishment from such an atmosphere my repetent after he had had patience with my rambling discourse for some time gave me at last to understand that i must first of all keep my immediate object in view which was to be examined to take my degree and then perchance to commence practice regarding the former said he the subject is by no means investigated at large it is inquired how and when the law arose and what gave the internal or external occasion for it there is no inquiry as to how it has been altered by time and custom 
or how far it has perhaps been perverted by false interpretation or the perverted usage of the courts it is in such investigations that learned men quite peculiarly spend their lives whereas we inquire into that which exists at present this we stamp firmly on our memory that it may always be ready when we wish to employ it for the use and defence of our clients thus we qualify our young people for their future life and the rest follows in proportion to their talents and activity hereupon he handed me his pamphlets which were written in question and answer and in which i could have stood a pretty good examination at once for hop's smaller law catechism was yet perfectly in my memory the rest i supplied with some diligence and against my will qualified myself in the easiest manner as a candidate but since in this way all my own activity in the study was cut off for i had no sense for anything positive but wished to have everything explained historically if not intelligibly i found for my powers a wider field which i employed in the most singular manner by devoting myself to a matter of interest which was accidentally presented to me from without End of section twenty nine The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1 by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, Section 30. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1 by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, Section 30. Ninth Book, Part 2. Most of my fellow boarders were medical students these as is well known are the only students who zealously converse about their science and profession even out of the hours of study this lies in the nature of the case the objects of their endeavours are those most obvious to the senses and at the same time the highest the most simple and the most complicated medicine employs the whole man for it occupies itself with man as a whole all that the young man learns refers directly to an important dangerous indeed but yet in many respects lucrative practice he therefore devotes himself passionately to whatever is to be known and to be done partly because it is interesting in itself partly because it opens to him the joyous prospect of independence and wealth at table then i heard nothing but medical conversations just as formerly in the boarding-house of hofrat ludwig in our walks and in our pleasure parties likewise not much else was talked about for my fellow boarders like good fellows had also become my companions at other times and they were always joined on all sides by persons of like minds and like studies the medical faculty in general shone above the others with respect both to the celebrity of the professors and the number of the students and i was the more easily borne along by the stream as i had just so much knowledge of all these things that my desire for science could soon be increased and inflamed at the commencement of the second half-year, therefore, I attended Spielmann's course on chemistry, another on anatomy by Lobstein, and proposed to be right industrious, because by my singular preliminary, or rather extra knowledge, I had already gained some respect and confidence in our society. Yet this trifling and piecemeal way of study was even to be once more seriously disturbed for a remarkable political event set everything in motion and procured us a tolerable succession of holidays marie antoinette archduchess of austria and queen of france 
was to pass through Strasbourg on her road to Paris. The solemnities by which the people are made to take notice that there is greatness in the world were busily and abundantly prepared, and especially remarkable to me was the building which stood on an island in the Rhine between the two bridges erected for her reception and for surrendering her into the hands of her husband's ambassadors. It was but slightly raised above the ground, had in the centre a grand saloon, on each side smaller ones, then followed other chambers which extended somewhat backward. In short, had it been more durably built, it might have answered very well as a pleasure house for persons of rank. But what particularly interested me, and for which I did not grudge many a busel, a little silver coin then current, in order to procure a repeated entrance from the porter, was the embroidered tapestry with which they had lined the whole interior. Here, for the first time, I saw a specimen of those tapestries worked after Raffaele's cartoons and this sight was for me of very decided influence, as I became acquainted with the true and the perfect on a large scale, though only in copies. I went and came and came and went, and could not satiate myself with looking. Nay, a vain endeavour troubled me, because I would willingly have comprehended what interested me in so extraordinary a manner, I found these side chambers highly delightful and refreshing, but the chief saloon so much the more shocking. This had been hung with many larger, more brilliant and richer hangings, which were surrounded with crowded ornaments, worked after pictures by the modern French. Now I might perhaps have become reconciled to this style also as my feelings, like my judgment, did not readily reject anything entirely, but the subject was excessively revolting to me. These pictures contained the history of Jason, Medea, and Creusa, and therefore an example of the most unhappy marriage. To the left of the throne was seen the bride, struggling with the most horrible death, surrounded by persons full of sympathizing woe. To the right was the father, horrified at the murdered babes before his feet, whilst the fury in her dragon car drove along into the air. And that the horrible and atrocious should not lack something absurd, the white tail of that magic bull flourished out on the right hand from behind the red velvet of the gold embroidered back of the throne, while the fire-spitting beast himself and the Jason who was fighting with him were completely covered by the sumptuous drapery. Here all the maxims which I had made my own in Ursa's school were stirring within my bosom. It was without proper selection and judgment to begin with, that Christ and the Apostles were brought into the side halls of a nuptial building, and doubtless the size of the chambers had guided the royal tapestry keeper. This, however, I willingly forgave, because it had turned out so much to my advantage. But a blunder like that in the grand saloon put me altogether out of my self-possession and with animation and vehemence I called on my comrades to witness such a crime against taste and feeling. What, cried I, without regarding the bystanders, is it permitted to thoughtlessly place before the eyes of a young queen at her first setting foot in her dominions the representation of the most horrible marriage that perhaps ever was consummated? Is there among the French architects, decorators, upholsterers, not a single man who understands that pictures represent something. The pictures work upon the mind and feelings, that they make impressions, that they excite forebodings. 
it is just the same as if they had sent the most ghastly spectre to meet this beauteous and pleasure-loving lady at the very frontiers i know not what i said besides enough my comrades tried to quiet me and to remove me out of the house that there might be no offence they then assured me that it was not everybody's concern to look for significance in pictures that to themselves at least nothing of the sort would have occurred while the whole population of Strasbourg and the vicinity, which was to throng thither, would no more take such crotchets into their heads than the Queen herself and her court. I yet remember well the beauteous and lofty mien, as cheerful as it was imposing, of this youthful lady, perfectly visible to us all in her glass carriage, she seemed to be jesting with her female attendants in familiar conversation about the throng that poured forth to meet her train in the evening we roamed through the streets to look at the various illuminated buildings but especially the glowing spire of the minster with which both near and in the distance we could not sufficiently feast our eyes the queen pursued her way the country people dispersed and the city was soon quiet as ever before the queen's arrival the very reasonable regulation had been made that no deformed persons no cripples nor disgusting invalids should show themselves on her route people joked about this and i made a little french poem in which i compared the advent of christ who seemed to wander upon earth particularly on account of the sick and lame with the arrival of the queen who scared these unfortunates away my friends let it pass a frenchman on the contrary who lived with us criticised the language in metre very unmercifully although as it seemed with too much foundation and i do not remember that i ever made a french poem afterwards no sooner had the news of the queen's happy arrival rung from the capital than it was followed by the horrible intelligence that owing to an oversight of the police during the festal fireworks an infinite number of persons with horses and carriages had been destroyed in the street obstructed by building materials and that the city in the midst of the nuptial solemnities had been plunged into mourning and sorrow they attempted to conceal the extent of the misfortune both from the young royal pair and from the world by burying the dead in secret so that many families were convinced only by the ceaseless absence of their members that they too had been swept off by this awful event that on this occasion those ghastly figures in the grand saloon again came vividly before my mind i need scarcely mention for every one knows how powerful certain moral impressions are when they embody themselves as it were in those of the senses this occurrence was however destined moreover to place my friends in anxiety and trouble by means of a prank in which i indulged among us young people who had been at leipzig there had been maintained ever afterwards a certain itch for imposing on and in some way mystifying one another with this wanton love of mischief i wrote to a friend in frankfurt he was the one who had amplified my poem on the cake baker hendel applied it to Maidon and caused its general circulation a letter dated from versailles in which i informed him of my happy arrival there my participation in the solemnities and other things of the kind but at the same time enjoined the strictest secrecy i must here remark that from the time of that trick which had caused us so much annoyance 
our little Leipzig society had accustomed itself to persecute him from time to time with mystifications, and this especially as he was the drollest man in the world, and was never more amiable than when he was discovering the cheat into which he had deliberately been led. Shortly after I had written this letter, I went on a little journey and remained absent about a fortnight. Meanwhile, the news of that disaster had reached Frankfurt. My friend believed me in Paris, and his affection led him to apprehend that I might have been involved in the calamity. He inquired of my parents and other persons to whom I was accustomed to write whether any letters had arrived and as it was just at the time when my journey kept me from sending any they were altogether wanting he went about in the greatest uneasiness and at last told the matter in confidence to our nearest friends who were now in equal anxiety fortunately this conjecture did not reach my parents until a letter had arrived announcing my return to strasbourg my young friends were satisfied to learn that I was alive, but remained firmly convinced that I had been at Paris in the interim. The affectionate intelligence of the solicitude they had felt on my account affected me so much that I vowed to leave off such tricks for ever. But unfortunately I have often since allowed myself to be guilty of something similar, Real life frequently loses its brilliancy to such a degree that one is many a time forced to polish it up again with the varnish of fiction. This mighty stream of courtly magnificence had now flowed by and had left me in no other longing than after those tapestries of Raffaele, which I would willingly have gazed at, revered, nay adored every day and every hour fortunately my passionate endeavours succeeded in interesting several persons of consequence in them so that they were taken down and packed up as late as possible we now gave ourselves up again to our quiet easy routine of the university and society and in the latter the actuary salzmann president of our table continued to be the general pedagogue his intelligence complacence and dignity which he always contrived to maintain amid all the jests and often even in the little extravagances which he allowed us made him beloved and respected by the whole company and i could mention but few instances where he showed his serious displeasure or interposed with authority in little quarrels and disputes yet among them all i was the one who most attached myself to him and he was not less inclined to converse with me as he found me more variously accomplished than the others and not so one-sided in judgment i also followed his directions in external matters so that he could without hesitation publicly acknowledge me as his companion and comrade for although he only filled an office which seems to be of little influence he administered it in a manner which redounded to his highest honour he was actually to the court of wards pupillen collegium and there indeed like the perpetual secretary of a university he had properly speaking the management of affairs in his own hands now as he had performed the duties of this office with the greatest exactness for many years there was no family from the first to the last which did not owe him its gratitude as indeed scarcely any one in the whole administration of government can earn more blessings or more curses than one who takes charge of the orphans or on the contrary squanders or suffers to be squandered their property and goods the strasburgers are passionate walkers and they have a good right to be so 
let one turn his steps as he will he will find pleasure grounds partly natural partly adorned by art in ancient and modern times all of them visited and enjoyed by a cheerful merry little people but what made the sight of a great number of pedestrians still more agreeable here than in other places was the various costume of the fair sex the middle class of city girls yet retained the hair twisted up and secured by a large pin as well as a certain close style of dress in which anything like a train would have been unbecoming and the pleasant part of it was that this costume did not differ violently according to the rank of the wearer for there were still some families of opulence and distinction who would not permit their daughters to deviate from this costume the rest followed the french fashion and this party made some proselytes every year salzmann had many acquaintances and an entrance everywhere a very pleasant circumstance for his companions especially in summer for good company and refreshment were found in all the public gardens far and near and more than one invitation for this or that pleasant day was received on one such occasion i found an opportunity to recommend myself very rapidly to a family which i was visiting for only the second time we were invited and arrived at the appointed hour the company was not large some played and some walked as usual afterwards when they were to go to supper i saw our hostess and her sister speaking to each other with animation and as if in a peculiar embarrassment i accosted them and said i have indeed no right ladies to force myself into your secrets but perhaps i may be able to give you good counsel or even to serve you upon this they disclosed to me their painful dilemma namely that they had invited twelve persons to table and that just at that moment a relation had returned from a journey who now as the thirteenth would be a fatal memento mori if not for himself yet certainly for some of the guests the case is very easily mended replied i permit me to take my leave and stipulate for indemnification as they were persons of consequence and good breeding they would by no means allow this but sent about in the neighbourhood to find a fourteenth i suffered them to do so yet when i saw the servant coming in at the garden gate without having effected his errand I stole away and spent my evening pleasantly under the old linden trees of the Wanzenau. That this self-denial was richly repaid me was a very natural consequence. A certain kind of general society is not to be thought of without card-playing. Salzmann renewed the good instructions of Madame Böhme and i was the more docile as i had really seen that by this little sacrifice if it be one one may procure oneself much pleasure and even a greater freedom in society than one would otherwise enjoy the old piquet which had gone to sleep was again looked out i learned whist i made myself according to the directions of my mentor a card purse which was to remain untouched under all circumstances and i now found opportunity to spend most of my evenings with my friend in the best circles where for the most part they wished me well and pardoned me many a little irregularity to which nevertheless my friend though kindly enough used to call my attention but that i might experience symbolically how much one even in externals has to adapt oneself to society and direct oneself according to it i was compelled to something which seemed to me the most disagreeable thing in the world i had really very fine hair 
but my strasbourg hairdresser at once assured me that it was cut much too short behind and that it would be impossible to make a frisure of it in which i could show myself since nothing but a few short curls in front were decreed lawful and all the rest from the crown must be tied up in a queue or a hair bag nothing was left but to put up with false hair till the natural growth was again restored according to the demands of the time he promised me that nobody should ever remark this innocent perception against which i objected at first very earnestly if i could resolve upon it immediately he kept his word and i was always looked upon as the young man who had the best and the best dressed head of hair but as i was obliged to remain thus propped up and powdered from early morning and at the same time to take care not to betray my false ornament by heating myself or by violent motions this restraint in fact contributed much to my behaving for a time more quietly and politely and accustomed me to going with my hat under my arm and consequently in shoes and stockings also however i did not venture to neglect wearing under stockings of fine leather as a defence against the rhine gnats which on the fine summer evenings generally spread themselves over the meadows and gardens under these circumstances violent bodily motion being denied me our social conversations grew more and more animated and impassioned indeed they were the most interesting in which i had hitherto ever borne part with my way of feeling and thinking it cost me nothing to let every one pass for what he was nay for that which he wished to pass for and thus the frankness of a fresh youthful heart which manifested itself almost for the first time in its full bloom made me many friends and adherents our company of boarders increased to about twenty persons and as salzmann kept up his accustomed order everything continued in its old routine nay the conversation was almost more decorous as every one had to be on his guard before several among the newcomers was a man who particularly interested me his name was jung the same who afterwards became known under the name of stilling in spite of an antiquated dress his form had something delicate about it with a certain sturdiness a bag wig did not disfigure his significant and pleasing countenance his voice was mild without being soft and weak it became even melodious and powerful as soon as his ardour was roused which was very easily done on becoming better acquainted with him one found in him a sound common sense which rested on feeling and therefore took its tone from the affections and passions and from this very feeling sprang an enthusiasm for the good the true and the just in the greatest possible purity for the course of this man's life had been very simple and yet crowded with events and with manifold activity the element of his energy was indestructible faith in god and in an assistance flowing immediately from him which evidently manifested itself in an uninterrupted providence and in an unfailing deliverance out of all troubles and from every evil jung had made many such experiences in his life and they had often been repeated of late in strasbourg so that with the greatest cheerfulness he led a life frugal indeed but free from care and devoted himself most earnestly to his studies although he could not reckon upon any certain subsistence from one quarter to another in his youth when on a fair way to become a charcoal burner 
he took up the trade of a tailor and after he had instructed himself at the same time in higher matters his knowledge loving mind drove him to the occupation of schoolmaster this attempt failed and he returned to his trade from which however since every one felt for him confidence and affection he was repeatedly called away again to take a place as a private tutor but for his most internal and peculiar training he had to thank that widespread class of men who sought out their salvation on their own responsibility and who while they strove to edify themselves by reading the scriptures and good books and by mutual exhortation and confession thereby attained a degree of cultivation which must excite surprise for while the interest which always accompanied them and which maintained them in fellowship rested on the simplest foundation of morality well-wishing and well-doing the deviations which would take place with men of such limited circumstances were of little importance and hence their consciences for the most part remained clear and their minds commonly cheerful so there arose no artificial but a truly natural culture which yet had this advantage over others that it was suitable to all ages and ranks and was generally social by its nature for this reason too these persons were in their own circle truly eloquent and capable of expressing themselves appropriately and pleasingly on all the tenderest and best concerns of the heart now good jung was in this very case among a few persons who if not exactly like-minded with himself did not declare themselves averse from his mode of thought he was found not only talkative but eloquent in particular he related the history of his life in the most delightful manner and knew how to make all the circumstances plainly and vividly present to his listeners i persuaded him to write them down and he promised to do so but because in his way of expressing himself he was like a somnambulist who must not be called by name lest he should fall from his elevation or like a gentle stream to which one dare oppose nothing lest it should foam he was often constrained to feel uncomfortable in a more numerous company his faith tolerated no doubt and his conviction no jest while in friendly communication he was inexhaustible everything came to a standstill with him when he met with contradiction i usually helped him through on such occasions for which he repaid me with honest affection since his mode of thought was nothing strange to me but on the contrary i had already become accurately acquainted with it in my very best friends of both sexes and since moreover it generally interested me with its naturalness and naivete he found himself on the very best terms with me the bent of his intellect was pleasing to me nor did i meddle with his faith in miracles which was so useful to him salzmann likewise behaved towards him with forbearance i say with forbearance for salzmann in conformity with his character his natural disposition his age and circumstances could not but stand and continue on the side of the rational or rather the common sense christians whose religion properly rested on the rectitude of their characters and a manly independence and who therefore did not like to meddle or have anything to do with feelings which might easily have led them into gloom or with mysticism which might easily have led them into the dark this class too was respectable and numerous all men of honour and capacity understood each other and were of the like persuasion as well as of the same mode of life lerser likewise our fellow-boarder 
also belonged to this number. A perfectly upright young man, and with limited gifts of fortune, frugal and exact. His manner of life and housekeeping was the closest I ever knew among students. He was of us all the most neatly dressed, and yet always appeared in the same clothes. But he managed his wardrobe with the greatest care, kept everything about him clean, and required all things in ordinary life to go according to his example. He never happened to lean anywhere, or to prop his elbow on the table. He never forgot to mark his table napkin, and the maid always had a bad time of it when the chairs were not found perfectly clean. With all this, he had nothing stiff in his exterior. He spoke cordially, with precise and dry liveliness in which a light ironical joke was very becoming. In figure, he was well built, slender, and of fair height. His face was pock-pitted and homely his little blue eyes cheerful and penetrating. As he had cause to tutor us in so many respects, we let him be our fencing master besides, for he drew a very fine rapier. And it seemed to give him sport to play off upon us on this occasion all the pedantry of this profession. Moreover, we really profited by him and had to thank him for many sociable hours which he induced us to spend in good exercise and practice. By all these peculiarities, Lausser completely qualified himself for the office of arbitrator and umpire in all the small and great quarrels which happened, no, but really, in our circle, and which Salzmann could not hush up in his fatherly way. Without the external forms, which do so much mischief in universities, we represented a society bound together by circumstances and good feeling, which others might occasionally touch, but into which they could not intrude. Now, in his judgment of internal peaks, Lerse always showed the greatest impartiality, and when the affair could no longer be settled by words and explanations, he knew how to conduct the desired satisfaction, in an honourable way, to a harmless issue. In this, no man was more clever than he. Indeed, he often used to say that since heaven had destined him for a hero, neither in war nor in love, he would be content, both in romances and fighting, with the part of second. Since he remained the same throughout, and might be regarded as a true model of a good and steady disposition, the conception of him stamped itself as deeply as amiably upon me, and when I wrote Goethe's von Berlichingen, I felt myself induced to set up a memorial of our friendship, and to give the gallant fellow who knew how to subordinate himself in so dignified a manner the name of Franz Lesser. While by his constant humorous dryness he continued ever to remind us of what one owed to oneself and to others, and how one ought to behave in order to live at peace with men as long as possible, and thus gain a certain position towards them, I had to fight, both inwardly and outwardly, with quite different circumstances and adversaries being at strife with myself, with the objects around me, and even with the elements. I was then in a state of health which furthered me sufficiently in all that I would and should undertake, only there was a certain irritability left behind, which did not always let me be in equilibrium. A loud sound was disagreeable to me, diseased objects awakened in me loathing and horror. But I was especially troubled with a giddiness which came over me every time I looked down from a height. 
all these infirmities i tried to remedy and indeed as i wished to lose no time in a somewhat violent way in the evening when they beat the tattoo i went near the multitude of drums the powerful rolling and beating of which might have made one's heart burst in one's bosom all alone i ascended the highest pinnacle of the minster spire and sat in what is called the neck under the knob or crown for a quarter of an hour before i would venture to step out again into the open air where standing upon a platform scarce an l square without any particular holding one sees the boundless prospect before while the nearest objects and ornaments conceal the church and everything upon and above which one stands it is exactly as if one saw oneself carried up into the air in a balloon such troublesome and painful sensations are repeated until the impression became quite indifferent to me and i have since then derived great advantage from this training in mountain travels and geological studies and on great buildings where i have vied with the carpenters in running over the bare beams and the cornices of the edifice and even in Rome, where one must run similar risks to obtain a nearer view of important works of art. Anatomy also was of double value to me, as it taught me to endure the most repulsive sights, while I satisfied my thirst for knowledge. And thus I also attended the clinical course of the elder Dr. Almann, as well as the lectures of his son on obstetrics with the double view of becoming acquainted with all conditions and of freeing myself from all apprehension as to repulsive things and i have actually succeeded so far that nothing of this kind could ever put me out of my self-possession but i endeavoured to harden myself not only against these impressions on the senses but also against the infections of the imagination the awful and shuddering impressions of the darkness in churchyards solitary places churches and chapels by night and whatever may be connected with them i contrived to render likewise indifferent and in this also i went so far that day and night and every locality were quite the same to me so that even when in later times a desire came over me once more to feel in such scenes the pleasing shudder of youth i could hardly compel this in any degree by calling up the strangest and most fearful images End of section thirty. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1, by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, Section 31. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1, by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, Section 31. Ninth Book, Part 3 in my efforts to free myself from the pressure of the too gloomy and powerful which continued to rule within me and seemed to me sometimes as strength sometimes as weakness i was thoroughly assisted by that open social stirring manner of life which attracted me more and more to which i accustomed myself and which i at last learned to enjoy with perfect freedom it is not difficult to remark in the world that man feels himself most freely and most perfectly rid of his own feelings when he represents to himself the faults of others and expatiates upon them with complacent censoriousness it is a tolerably pleasant sensation even to set ourselves above our equals by disapprobation and misrepresentation for which reason good society whether it consists of few or many 
is most delighted with it. But nothing equals the comfortable self-complacency when we erect ourselves into judges of our superiors and of those who are set over us, of princes and statesmen, when we find public institutions unfit and injudicious, only consider the possible and actual obstacles and recognize neither the greatness of the invention nor the cooperation which is to be expected from time and circumstances in every undertaking. Whoever remembers the condition of the French kingdom and is accurately and circumstantially acquainted with it from later writings will easily figure to himself how at that time in the alsatian semi-france people used to talk about the king and his ministers about the court and court favourites these were new subjects for my love of instructing myself and very welcome ones to my pertness and youthful conceit i observed everything accurately noted it down industriously and i now see from the little that is left that such accounts although are only put together on the moment out of fables and uncertain general rumours always have a certain value in after times because they serve to confront and compare the secret made known at last with what was then already discovered and public and the judgment of contemporaries true or false with the convictions of posterity striking and daily before the eyes of us street loungers was the project for beautifying the city the execution of which according to drafts and plans began in the strangest fashion to pass from sketches and plans into reality intendant gayo had undertaken to new model the angular and uneven lanes of strasbourg and to lay the foundations of a respectable handsome city regulated by line and level upon this blondel a parisian architect drew a plan by which an hundred and forty householders gained in room eighty lost and the rest remained in their former condition this plan accepted but not to be put into execution at once now should in course of time have been approaching completion and meanwhile the city oddly enough wavered between form and formlessness if for instance a crooked side of a street was to be straightened the first man who felt disposed to build moved forward to the appointed line perhaps to his next neighbour but perhaps also the third or fourth resident from him by which projections the most awkward recesses were left like front courtyards before the houses in the background they would not use force yet without compulsion they would never have got on on which account no man when his house was once condemned ventured to improve or replace anything that related to the street all these strange accidental inconveniences gave to us rambling idlers the most welcome opportunity of practising our ridicule of making proposals in the manner of bayrish for accelerating the completion and of constantly doubting the possibility of it although many a newly erected handsome building should have brought us to other thoughts how far that project was advanced by the length of time i cannot say another subject on which the protestant strasbourgers like to converse was the expulsion of the jesuits these fathers as soon as the city had fallen to the share of the french had made their appearance and sought a domicilium but they soon extended themselves and built a magnificent college which bordered so closely on the minster that the back of the church covered a third part of its front 
it was to be a complete quadrangle and have a garden in the middle three sides of it were finished it is of stone and solid like all the buildings of these fathers that the protestants were pushed hard if not oppressed by them lay in the plan of the society which made it a duty to restore the old religion in its whole compass their fall therefore awakened the greatest satisfaction in the opposite party and people saw not without pleasure how they sold their wines carried away their books and the building was assigned to another perhaps less active order how glad are men when they get rid of an opponent or only of a guardian and the herd does not reflect that where there is no dog it is exposed to wolves now since every city must have its tragedy at which children and children's children shudder so in strasbourg frequent mention was made of the unfortunate praetor klingling who after he had mounted the highest step of earthly felicity ruled city and country with almost absolute power and enjoyed all that wealth rank and influence could afford had at last lost the favour of the court and was dragged up to answer for all in which he had been indulged hitherto nay was even thrown into prison where more than seventy years old he died an ambiguous death this and other tales that knight of st louis our fellow boarder knew how to tell with passion and animation for which reason i was fond of accompanying him in his walks unlike the others who avoided such invitations and left me alone with him as with new acquaintances i generally took my ease for a long time without thinking much about them or the effect which they were exercising upon me so i only remarked gradually that his stories and opinions rather unsettled and confused than instructed and enlightened me i never knew what to make of him although the riddle might easily have been solved he belonged to the many to whom life offers no results and who therefore from first to last exert themselves on individual objects unfortunately he had with this a decided desire nay even passion for meditating without having any capacity for thinking and in such men a particular notion easily fixes itself fast which may be regarded as a mental disease to such a fixed view he always came back again and was thus in the long run excessively tiresome he would bitterly complain of the decline of his memory especially with regard to the latest events and maintained by a logic of his own that all virtue springs from a good memory and all vice on the contrary from forgetfulness this doctrine he contrived to carry out with much acuteness as indeed anything may be maintained when one has no compunction to use words altogether vaguely and to employ and apply them in a sense now wider now narrower now closer now more remote at first it was amusing to hear him nay his persuasiveness even astonished us we fancied we were standing before a rhetorical sophist who for jest and practice knew how to give a fair appearance to the strangest things unfortunately this first impression became blunted but too soon for at the end of every discourse manage the thing as i would the man came back again to the same theme he was not to be held fast to older events though they interested him although he had them present to his mind with their minutest circumstances indeed he was often by a small circumstance snatched out of the middle of a wild historical narrative and thrust into his detestable favourite thought 
one of our afternoon walks was particularly unfortunate in this respect the account of it may stand here instead of similar cases which might weary if not vex the reader on the way through the city we were met by an old female mendicant who by her beggings and importunities disturbed him in his story pack yourself off old witch said he and walked by she shouted after him the well-known retort only somewhat changed since she saw well that the unfriendly man was old himself if you did not wish to be old you should have had yourself hanged in your use he turned round violently and i feared a scene hanged cried he have myself hanged no that could not have been i was too honest a fellow for that but hang myself hang up my own self that is true that i should have done i should have turned a charge of powder against myself that i might not live to see that i am not even worth that any more the woman stood as if petrified but he continued you have said a great truth which mother and as they have neither drowned nor burned you yet you shall be paid for your proverb he handed her a boussole a coin not usually given to a beggar we had crossed over the first rhine bridge and were going to the inn where we meant to stop and i was trying to lead him back to our previous conversation when unexpectedly a very pretty girl met us on the pleasant footpath remained standing before us bowed prettily and cried hey, hey captain where are you going and whatever else is usually said on such an occasion mademoiselle replied he somewhat embarrassed i know not how said she with graceful astonishment do you forget your friends so soon the word forget fretted him he shook his head and replied peevishly enough truly mademoiselle i did not know she now retorted with some humour yet very temperately take care captain i may mistake you another time and so she hurried past taking huge strides without looking round at once my fellow-traveller struck his forehead with both his fists oh what an ass i am exclaimed he what an old ass i am now you see whether i am right or not and then in a very violent manner he went on with his usual sayings and opinions in which this case still more confirmed him i cannot and would not repeat what a philippic discourse he held against himself at last he turned to me and said i call you to witness you remember that small ware woman at the corner who is neither young nor pretty i salute her every time we pass and often exchange a couple of friendly words with her and yet it is thirty years ago since she was gracious to me but now i swear it is not four weeks since this young lady showed herself more complacent to me than was reasonable and yet i will not recognize her but insult her in return for her favours do i not always say that ingratitude is the greatest of vices and no man will be ungrateful if he were not forgetful we went into the inn and nothing but the tippling swarming crowd in the ante-room stopped the invectives which he rattled off against himself and his contemporaries he was silent and i hoped pacified when we stepped into an upper chamber where he found the young man pacing up and down alone whom the captain saluted by name i was pleased to become acquainted with him for the old fellow had said much good of him to me and had told me that this young man being employed in the war bureau had often disinterestedly done him very good service when the pensions were stopped i was glad that the conversation took a general turn and while we were carrying it on we drank a bottle of wine but here 
unluckily another infirmity which my knight had in common with obstinate men developed itself for as on the whole he could not get rid of that fixed notion so did he stick fast to a disagreeable impression of the moment and suffer his feelings to run on without moderation his last vexation about himself had not yet died away and now was added something new although of quite a different kind he had not long cast his eyes here and there before he noticed on the table a double portion of coffee and two cups and might besides being a man of gallantry have traced some other indication that the young man had not been so solitary all the time and scarcely had the conjecture arisen in his mind and ripened into a probability that the pretty girl had been paying a visit here that the most outrageous jealousy added itself to that first vexation so as to completely perplex him now before i could suspect anything for i had hitherto been conversing quite harmlessly with the young man the captain in an unpleasant tone which i well knew began to be satirical about the pair of cups and about this and that the young man surprised tried to turn it off pleasantly and sensibly as is the custom among men of good breeding but the old fellow continued to be unmercifully rude so that there was nothing left for the other to do but to seize his hat and cane and at his departure to leave behind him a pretty unequivocal challenge the fury of the captain now burst out the more vehemently as he had in the interim drunk another bottle of wine almost by himself he struck the table with his fist and cried more than once i will strike him dead it was not however meant quite so badly as it sounded for he often used this phrase when any one opposed or otherwise displeased him just as unexpectedly the business grew worse on our return for i had the want of foresight to represent to him his ingratitude towards the young man and to remind him how strongly he had praised to me the ready obligingness of this official person oh such rage of a man against himself i never saw again it was the most passionate conclusion to that beginning to which the pretty girl had given occasion here i saw sorrow and repentance carried into caricature and as all passion supplies the place of genius to a point really genius-like he then went over all the incidents of our afternoon ramble again employed them rhetorically for his own self-reproach brought up the old witch at last before him once more and perplexed himself to such a degree that i could not help fearing he would throw himself into the rhine could i have been sure of fishing him out again quickly like mentor his telemachus he might have made the leap and i should have brought him home cooled down for the occasion i immediately confided the affair to lerse and we went the next morning to the young man whom my friend in his dry way set laughing we agreed to bring about an accidental meeting where a reconciliation should take place of itself the drollest thing about it was that this time the captain too had slept off his rudeness and found himself ready to apologize to the young man to whom petty quarrels were of some consequence all was arranged in one morning and as the affair had not been kept quite secret i did not escape the jokes of my friends who might have foretold me from their own experience how troublesome the friendship of the captain could become upon occasion but now while i am thinking what should be imparted next there comes again into my thoughts by a strange play of memory that reverend minster building to which in those days i devoted particular attention and which in general constantly presents itself to the eye both in the city and in the country 
the more i considered the facade the more was that first impression strengthened and developed that here the sublime had entered into alliance with the pleasing if the vast when it appears as a mass before us is not to terrify if it is not to confuse when we seek to investigate its details it must enter into an unnatural apparently impossible connection it must associate to itself the pleasing but now since it will be impossible for us to speak of the impression of the minster except by considering both these incompatible qualities as united so do we already see from this in what high value we must hold this ancient monument and we begin in earnest to describe how such contradictory elements could peaceably interpenetrate and unite themselves first of all without thinking of the towers we devote our considerations to the facade alone which powerfully strikes the eye as an upright oblong parallelogram if we approach it at twilight in the moonshine on a starlight night when the parts appear more or less indistinct and at last disappear we see only a colossal wall the height of which bears an advantageous proportion to the breadth if we view it by day and by the power of the mind abstract from the details we recognize the front of a building which not only encloses the space within but also covers much in its vicinity the openings of this monstrous surface point to internal necessities and according to these we can at once divide it into nine compartments the great middle door which opens into the nave of the church first meets the eye on both sides of it lie two smaller ones belonging to the crossways over the chief door our glance falls upon the wheel-shaped window which is to spread an awe-inspiring light within the church and its vaulted arches at its sides appear two large perpendicular oblong openings which form a striking contrast with the middle one and indicate that they belong to the base of the rising towers in the third story are three openings in a row which are designed for belfries and other church necessities above them one sees the whole horizontally closed by the balustrade of the gallery instead of a cornice these nine spaces described are supported enclosed and separated into three great perpendicular divisions by four pillars rising up from the ground now as it cannot be denied that there is in the whole mass a fine proportion of height to breadth so also in the details it maintains a somewhat uniform lightness by means of these pillars and the narrow compartments between them but if we adhere to our abstraction and imagine to ourselves this immense wall without ornaments with firm buttresses with the necessary openings in it but only so far as necessity requires them we even then must allow that these chief divisions are in good proportion thus the whole will appear solemn and noble indeed but always heavily unpleasant and being without ornament unartistical for a work of art the whole of which is conceived in great simple harmonious parts makes indeed a noble and dignified impression but the peculiar enjoyment which the pleasing produces can only find place in the consonance of all developed details and it is precisely here that the building we are examining satisfies us in the highest degree for we see all the ornaments fully suited to every part which they adorn they are subordinate to it they seem to have grown out of it such a manifoldness always gives great pleasure 
since it flows of its own accord from the suitable and therefore at the same time awakens the feeling of unity it is only in such cases that the execution is prized as the summit of art by such means now was a solid piece of masonry an impenetrable wall which had moreover to announce itself as the base of two heaven-high towers made to appear to the eye as if resting on itself consisting in itself but at the same time light and adorned and though pierced through in a thousand places to give the idea of indestructible firmness this riddle is solved in the happiest manner the openings in the wall its solid parts the pillars everything has its peculiar character which proceeds from its particular destination this communicates itself by degrees to the subdivisions hence everything is adorned in proportionate taste the great as well as the small is in the right place and can be easily comprehended and thus the pleasing presents itself in the vast i would refer only to the doors sinking in perspective into the thickness of the wall and adorned without end in their columns and pointed arches the window with its rose springing out of the round form to the outline of its framework as well as to the slender reed-like pillars of the perpendicular compartments let one represent to himself the pillars retreating step by step accompanied by little slender light pillared pointed structures likewise striving upwards and furnished with canopies to shelter the images of the saints and how at last every rib every boss seems like a flower head and row of leaves or some other natural object transformed into stone one may compare if not the building itself yet representations of the whole and of its parts for the purpose of reviewing and giving life to what i have said it may seem exaggerated to many for i myself though transported into love for this work at first sight required a long time to make myself intimately acquainted with its value End of section 31. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1, by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford. Section 32. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1, by Johann von Goethe. Translated by John Oxenford, section 32. Having grown up among those who found fault with Gothic architecture, I cherished my aversion from the abundantly overloaded, complicated ornaments, which, by their capriciousness, made a religious, gloomy character highly averse. I strengthened myself in this repugnance since i had only met with spiritless works of this kind in which one could perceive neither good proportions nor pure consistency but here i thought i saw a newer revelation of it since what was objectionable by no means appeared but the contrary opinion rather forced itself upon my mind but the longer i looked and considered i all the while thought i discovered yet greater merits beyond that which i have already mentioned the right proportion of the larger divisions the ornamental as judicious as rich even to the minutest were found out but now i recognize the connection of these manifold ornaments among each other the transition from one leading part to another the enclosing of details homogeneous indeed but yet greatly varying in form from the saint to the monster from the leaf to the dental the more i investigated the more i was astonished 
the more i amused and wearied myself with measuring and drawing so much the more did my attachment increase so that i spent much time partly in studying what actually existed partly in restoring in my mind and on paper what was wanting and unfinished especially in the towers finding that this building had been based on old german ground and grown thus far in genuine german times and that the name of the master on his modest gravestone was likewise of native sound and origin i ventured being incited by the worth of this work of art to change the hitherto decried appellation of quote, gothic architecture end quote, to claim it for our nation as quote, german architecture end quote nor did i fail to bring my patriotic views to light first orally and afterwards in a little treatise dedicated to the memory of Irvinus asteinbach if my biographical narrative should come down to the epoch when the said sheet appeared in print which herder afterwards inserted in his pamphlet quote, von deutscher art und kunst parenthesis, of german manner and art in parenthesis end quote. much more will be said on this weighty subject but before i turn from it this time i will take the opportunity to vindicate the motto prefixed to the present volume with those who may have entertained some doubt about it i know indeed very well that in opposition to this hopeful old german saying quote, of whatever one wishes in youth he has abundance in old age end quote. many would quote contrary experience and many trifling comments might be made but much also is to be said in its favor and i will explain how i understand it our wishes are presentiments of the capabilities which lie within us and harbingers of that which we shall be in a condition to perform whatever we are able and would like to do presents itself to our imagination as without us and in the future we feel a longing after that which we already possess in secret thus a passionate anticipating grasp changes the truly possible into a dreamed reality now if such a bias lies decidedly in our nature then with every step of our development will a part of the first wish be fulfilled under favorable circumstances in the direct way under unfavorable in the circuitous way from which we always come back again to the other thus we see men by perseverance attain to earthly wealth they surround themselves with riches splendor and external honor others strive yet more certainly after intellectual advantages acquire for themselves a clear survey of things a peacefulness of mind and a certainty of the present and the future but now there is a third direction which is compounded of both the issue of which must be the most surely successful when a man's youth falls into a pregnant time when production overweighs destruction and a presentiment is early awakened within him as to what such an epoch demands and promises he will then being forced by outward inducements to an active interest take hold now here now there and the wish to be active on many sides will be lively within him but so many accidental hindrances are associated with human limitation that here a thing once begun remains unfinished there that which is already grasped falls out of the hand and one wish after another is dissipated but had these wishes sprung out of a pure heart and in conformity with the necessities of the times one might composedly let them lie and fall right and left and be assured that these must not only be found out and picked up again but that also many kindred things which one has never touched and never even thought of will come to light if now during our own lifetime we see that performed by others for which we ourselves felt an earlier call but had been obliged to give it up with much besides then the beautiful feeling enters the mind that only mankind combined is the true man 
and that the individual can only be joyous and happy when he has the courage to feel himself in the whole. This contemplation is here in the right place, for when I reflect on the affection which drew me to these antique edifices, when I reckon up the time which I devoted to the Strasbourg minister alone, the attention with which I afterwards examined the cathedral at Cologne and that at Freiburg, and more and more felt the value of these buildings, I could even blame myself for having afterwards lost sight of them altogether nay for having left them completely in the background being attracted by a more developed art and when now in the latest times i see attention again turned to those objects when i see affection and even passion for them appearing and flourishing when i see able young persons seized with this passion recklessly devoting powers time care and property to these memorials of a past world then am I reminded with pleasure that what I formerly would and wished had a value. With satisfaction I see they not only know how to prize what was done by our forefathers, but that from existing unfinished beginnings they try to represent, in pictures at least, the original design, so as thus to make us acquainted with the thought which is ever the beginning and end of all undertakings and that they strive with considerate zeal to clear up and vivify what seems to be a confused past. Here I especially applaud the brave Sulpice Bousseret, who is indefatigably employed in a magnificent series of copper plates to exhibit the Cathedral of Cologne as the model of those vast conceptions the spirit of which like that of babel strove up to heaven and which were so out of proportion to earthly means that they were necessarily stopped fast in their execution if we have been hitherto astonished that such buildings proceeded only so far we shall learn with the greatest admiration what was really designed to be done would that literally artistic undertakings of this kind were duly patronized by all who have power wealth and influence that the great and gigantic views of our forefathers may be presented to our contemplation and that we may be able to form a conception of what they dare to desire the insight resulting from this will not remain fruitless and the judgment will for once at least be in a condition to exercise itself on these works with justice. Nay, this will be done most thoroughly if our active young friend, besides the monograph devoted to the Cathedral of Cologne, follows out, in detail, the history of our medieval architecture. When whatever is to be known about the practical exercise of this art is further brought to light, when the art is represented in all its fundamental features by a comparison with the greco-roman and the oriental egyptian little can remain to be done in this department and i when the results of such patriotic labors lie before the world as they are now known in friendly private communications shall be able with true content to repeat that motto in its best sense Quote, of whatever one wishes in youth, he will have enough in old age. End quote. But if, in operations like these, which belong to centuries, one can trust oneself to time and wait for opportunity, there are, on the contrary, other things which in youth must be enjoyed at once, fresh like ripe fruits. Let me be permitted, with this sudden turn, to mention dancing of which the ear is reminded as the eye is of the minister every day and every hour in strasbourg and all alsace from early youth my father himself had given my sister and me instruction in dancing a task which must have comforted strangely enough with so stern a man but he did not suffer his composure to be put out by it he drilled us in the positions and steps in a manner the most precise and when he had brought us far enough to dance a minuet he played for us something easily intelligible in three-four time 
on a flute douce, and we moved to it as well as we could. On the French theatre, likewise, I had seen from my youth upwards, if not ballets, yet pas seuls, and pas de deux, and had noticed in them various strange motions of the feet, and all sorts of springs. When we had had enough of the minuet, I requested my father to play some other dance music, of which our music books in their jigs and murkies offered us a rich supply, and I immediately found out, of myself, the steps and other motions for them, the time being quite suitable to my limbs, and, as it were, born with them. Footnote. A murky is defined as an old species of short composition for the harpsichord, with a lively murmuring accompaniment of the bass. End footnote. This pleased my father to a certain degree. Indeed, he often, by way of joke for himself and us, let the, quote, monkeys, end quote, dance in this way. After my misfortune with Gretchen, and during the whole of my residence in Leipzig, I did not make my appearance on the floor. On the contrary, I still remember that when, at a ball, they forced me into a minuet, both measure and motion seemed to have abandoned my limbs, and I could no longer remember either the steps or the figures, so that I should have been put to disgrace and shame if the greater part of the spectators had not maintained that my awkward behavior was pure obstinacy, assumed with the view of depriving the ladies of all desire to invite me and draw me into their circle against my will. During my residence in Frankfurt, I was quite cut off from such pleasures, but in Strasbourg, with other enjoyments of life, there soon arose in my limbs the faculty of keeping time. On Sundays and weekdays, one sauntered by no pleasure ground without finding there a joyous crowd assembled for the dance and for the most part revolving in the circle moreover there were private balls in the country houses and people were already talking of the brilliant masquerades of the coming winter here indeed i should have been out of my place and useless to the company when a friend who waltzed very well advised me to practice myself first in parties of a lower rank so that afterwards I might be worth something in the highest. He took me to a dancing master who was well known for his skill. This man promised me that when I had in some degree repeated the first elements and made myself master of them, he would then lead me farther. He was one of your dry, ready French characters and received me in a friendly manner. I paid him a month in advance and received twelve tickets, for which he agreed to give me certain hours' instruction. The man was strict and precise, but not pedantic, and as I already had some previous practice, I soon gave him satisfaction and received his commendation. One circumstance, however, greatly facilitated the instruction of this teacher. He had two daughters, both pretty, and both not yet twenty. Having been instructed in this art from their youth upwards, they showed themselves very skillful, and might have been able, as partners, soon to help even the most clumsy scholars into some cultivation. They were both very polite, spoke nothing but French, and I on my part did my best, that I might not appear awkward or ridiculous before them. I had the good fortune that they likewise praised me, and were always willing to dance a minuet to my father's little violin, and what indeed was more difficult for them, to initiate me by degrees into waltzing and whirling. Their father did not seem to have many customers, and they led a lonely life. For this reason they often asked me to remain with them after my hour, and to chat away the time a little, which I the more willingly did as the younger one pleased me well, and generally they both altogether behaved very becomingly. I often read aloud something from a novel, and they did the same. The elder, who was as handsome as, perhaps even handsomer than the second, but who did not correspond with my taste so well as the latter, 
always conducted herself towards me most obligingly and more kindly in every respect she was always at hand during the lesson and often protracted it hence i sometimes thought myself bound to offer back a couple of tickets to her father which however he did not accept the younger on the contrary although never showing me any ill will was more reserved and waited till she was called by her father before she relieved the elder the cause of this became manifest to me one evening when after the dance was done i was about to go into the sitting-room with the elder she held me back and said let us remain here a little longer for i will confess to you that my sister has with her a woman who tells fortunes from cards and who is to reveal to her how matters stand with an absent lover on whom her whole heart hangs and upon whom she has placed all her hope mine is free she continued and i must accustom myself to see it despised i thereupon said sundry pretty things to her replying that she could at once convince herself on that point by consulting the wise woman likewise that i would do so myself for i had long wished to learn something of the kind but lacked faith she blamed me for this and assured me that nothing in the world was surer than the responses of this oracle only it must be consulted not out of sport and mischief but solely in real affairs however i at last compelled her to go with me into that room as soon as she had ascertained that the consultation was over we found her sister in a very cheerful humor and even towards me she was kinder than usual sportive and almost witty for since she seemed to be secure of an absent friend she might have thought it no treachery to be a little gracious with a present friend of her sister's which she thought me to be the old woman was now flattered and good payment was promised her if she would tell the truth to the elder sister and to me with the usual preparations and ceremonies she began her business in order to tell the fair one's first fortune she carefully considered the situation of the cards she seemed to hesitate and would not speak out what she had to say i see now said the younger who was already being acquainted with the interpretation of such a magic tablet you hesitate and do not wish to disclose anything disagreeable to my sister but that is a cursed card the elder one turned pale but composed herself and said only speak out it will not cost one's head the old woman after a deep sigh showed her that she was in love that she was not beloved that another person stood in the way and other things of like import we saw the good girl's embarrassment the old woman thought something to improve the affair by giving hopes of letters and money letters said the lovely child i do not expect and money i do not desire if it is true as you say that i love i deserve a heart that loves me in return let us see if it will not be better replied the old woman as she shuffled the cards and laid them out a second time but before the eyes of all of us it had only become still worse the fair one stood not only more lonely but surrounded with many sorrows her lover had moved somewhat farther and the intervening figures nearer the old woman wished to try it a third time and in hopes of a better prospect but the beautiful girl could restrain herself no longer she broke out into uncontrollable weeping her lovely bosom heaved violently she turned round and rushed out of the room i knew not what to do inclination kept me with one present compassion drove me to the other my situation was painful enough comfort lucinda said the younger go after her i hesitated how could i comfort her without at least assuring her of some sort of affection and could i do that at such a moment in a cool moderate manner 
Let us go together, said I to Amelia. I know not whether my presence will do her good, replied she. Yet we went, but found the door bolted. Lucinda made no answer. We might knock, shout, entreat as we would. We must let her have her own way, said Amelia. She will not have it otherwise now. And indeed, when I called to my mind her manner from our very first acquaintance, she always had something violent and unequal about her, and chiefly showed her affection for me by not behaving to me with rudeness. What was I to do? I paid the old woman richly for the mischief she had caused, and was about to go, when Amelia said, I stipulate that the card shall now be cut for you too. The old woman was ready. Do not let me be present, cried I, and hastened downstairs. The next day I had not courage to go there. The third day, early in the morning, Amelia sent me a word by a boy, who had already brought me many a message from the sisters, and had carried back flowers and fruits to them in return, that I should not fail that day. I came at the usual hour and found the father alone, who in many respects improved my paces and steps, by goings and comings, by bearing and behavior, and, moreover, seemed to be satisfied with me. The younger daughter came in towards the end of the hour and danced with me a very graceful minuet, in which her movements were extraordinarily pleasing and her father declared that he had rarely seen a prettier and more nimble pair upon his floor. After the lesson, I went as usual into the sitting-room. The father left us alone. I missed Lucinda. She is in bed, said Amelia, and I am glad of it. Do not be concerned about it. Her mental illness is first alleviated when she fancies herself bodily sick. She does not like to die and therefore she then does what we wish. We have certain family medicines which she takes and reposes, and thus, by degrees, the swelling waves subside. She is indeed too good and amiable in such an imaginary sickness, and as she is in reality very well, and is only attacked by passion, she imagines various kinds of romantic deaths with which she frightens herself in a pleasant manner, like children when we tell them ghost stories. Thus, only last night, she announced to me with great vehemence that this time she would certainly die, and that only when she was really near death they should bring again before her the ungrateful false witness who had at first acted so handsomely to her and now treated her so ill. She would reproach him bitterly and then give up the ghost. I know not that I am guilty, exclaimed I, of having expressed any sort of affection for her. I know somebody who can best bear me witness in this respect. Amelia smiled and rejoined, I understand you, but if we are not discreet and determined, we shall all find ourselves in a bad plight together. What will you say if I entreat you not to continue your lessons? You have, I believe, four tickets yet of the last month, and my father has already declared that he finds it inexcusable to take your money any longer, unless you wish to devote yourself to the art of dancing in a more serious manner. What is required by a young man of the world you possess already. And do you, Amelia, give me this advice to avoid your house, replied I? Yes, I do, said she, but not of myself. Only listen. When you hastened away the day before yesterday, I had the cards cut for you, and the same response was repeated thrice, and each time more emphatically. You were surrounded by everything good and pleasing, by friends and great lords, and there was no lack of money. The ladies kept themselves at some distance. My poor sister in particular stood always the farthest off, one other advanced constantly near to you, but never came up to your side, for a third person, of the male sex, always came between. I will confess to you that I thought that I myself was meant by the second lady, and after this confession you will best comprehend 
my well-meant counsel. To an absent friend, I have promised my heart and my hand, and until now, I loved him above all. Yet it might be possible for your presence to become more important to me than hitherto. And what kind of a situation would you have between two sisters, one of whom you have made unhappy by your affection, and the other by your coldness? And all this ado about nothing, but only for a short time. For if we had not already known who you are, and what are your expectations, the cards would have placed it before my eyes in the clearest manners. Fare you well, she said, and gave me your hand. I hesitated. Now, said she, leading me towards the door, that it may really be the last time that we shall speak to each other, take what I would otherwise have denied you. She fell upon my neck and kissed me most tenderly. I embraced her and pressed her into my bosom. At this moment, the side door flew open, and her sister, in a light but becoming nightdress, rushed out and cried, You shall not be the only one to take leave of him. Amelia let me go, and Lucinda seized me, clung close to my heart pressed her black locks upon my cheeks, and remained in this position for some time. And thus I found myself between the two sisters, in the dilemma Amelia had prophesied to me in a moment before. Lucinda let me loose, and looked earnestly into my face. I was about to grasp her hand and say something friendly to her, but she turned herself away, walked with violent steps up and down the room for some time, and then threw herself into a corner of the sofa. Emilia went to her, but was immediately repulsed, and here began a scene which is yet painful to me in the recollection, and which, although really it had nothing theatrical about it, but was quite suitable to a lively young Frenchwoman could only be properly repeated in the theatre by a good and feeling actress. Lucinda overwhelmed her sister with a thousand reproaches. This is not the first heart, she cried, that was inclining itself to me, and that you have turned away. Was it not just so with him who is absent, and who at last betrothed himself to you under my very eyes? I was compelled to look on, I endured it, but I know how many thousand tears it has cost me. This one, too, you have now taken away from me, without letting the other go. And how many do you not manage to keep at once? I am frank and good-natured, and everyone thinks he knows me soon, and may neglect me. You are secret and quiet, and people think wonders about what may be concealed behind you. Yet there is nothing behind but a cold, selfish heart that can sacrifice everything to itself. This nobody learns so easily because it lies deeply hidden in your breast. And just as little do they know of my warm, true heart, which I carry about with me as open as my face. Emilia was silent and had sat down by her sister who became constantly more and more excited in her discourse, and let certain private matters slip out, which it was not exactly proper for me to know. Amelia, on the other hand, who was trying to pacify her sister, made me a sign from behind that I should withdraw. But as jealousy and suspicion see with a thousand eyes, Lucinda seemed to have noticed this also. She sprang up and advanced to me, but not with vehemence. She stood before me and seemed to be thinking of something. Then she said, I know that I have lost you. I make no further pretensions to you, but neither shall you have him, sister. So saying, she took a thorough hold of my head, thrusting both her hands into my locks and pressing my face to hers, and kissed me repeatedly on the mouth. Now, cried she, fear my curse, 
woe upon woe for ever and ever to her who kisses these lips for the first time after me dare to have anything more to do with him i know heaven hears me this time and you sir hasten now hasten away as fast as you can i flew down the stairs with the firm determination never again to enter the house End of section 32 End of the Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1, by Johann von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford.